call the meeting to order. We have nothing to announce out of closed session, so we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Adoption of agenda, if I don't see any objections to anything or changes on the agenda. Yes, I'd Trustee like, Martinson. I'd like to move 15.1 um, up to a discussion item since there's no final language to approve to a informational and discussion item. Until we have final language, then it should be an action item. Um, there's, there is an action to approve. There's no, there's no language. There's no resolution. There's no. There is. Okay. All right. We can, we'll, we'll see when we get there. If there is nothing else, any other changes, adoption, agenda adopted. 7.1, we now have a presentation from Army Corps of Engineers. Dr. Kraft, would you like to introduce? Yeah, um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Lieutenant Colonel Travis Rayfield and um, his assistant, not assistant, I'm so sorry, you'll have to self-introduce. And we're, we're um, extremely uh, happy to have you here and um, the floor is yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Travis Rayfield. I'm the commander for the San Francisco District for the Corps of Engineers, and I ask for just a moment of your time to uh, highlight some of the things that we've done here in Napa County and the greater area at large. And so uh, I want to respect your time, but I also want to share a little bit with you and recognize some of the members of here in this community that have helped us deliver a service in the public. So Suka Su is my public affairs specialist, and I can't highlight everyone that's helped us, but I can highlight a few people, and so I'd like to take a moment to do that. Before I do that, I just wanted to highlight a visual of what the Corps of Engineers has been doing and how Napa, Valley College, how Napa College has been helping us with that. So the Corps of Engineers is doing one emergency support function, ESF-3, which is private property debris removal, in support of FEMA, which has 14 different functions, in partnership with Cal OES uh, to get the debris from those horrible events that happened on October 8th through the 10th uh, off of people's private property. And, and here you have been a key partner for us in delivering that service. So I wanted to say a public thank you. Uh, and if you wanted a visual, if you drive across the Golden Gate Bridge and take that Golden Gate Bridge, rip it out of the water and spread it across four counties, do it again, and then do it a third time, that's how much debris we've taken off of people's private property. It's been a massive, massive operation. And so we're really looking forward to the point where we can get the local government to be the face of the program. Uh, but in our part of getting that private property debris removal out, in Napa County, you have provided a, a venue uh, through your facilities to allow us to deliver that service here in our, with our partners. Um, and so we wanted to highlight just a small portion of the team that has been, it, been there and helped us serve in that area. So first, uh, Dr. Kraft, just for the university, I'd like to leave with you a small certificate. And with that, uh, one of the things we have And the military is a thing called the challenge coin. Uh, it's for when it, whenever somebody does something excellent, the commander usually hands a coin. Uh, it's a small symbol of excellence for performance. And so I'd like to just leave you with one on behalf of the entire team. Uh, I'm going to take it out of the plastic so you know that it's new. Uh, and it, it's labeled California Wildfire Recovery 2017. And so when you hand it over, it's usually with a handshake, and then I'll hand you a small certificate. So that's for the whole university, thank so thank you. Oh. And if, if you want to do it right for okay. the picture, we're going to cheat. And okay. We're going to hold it up like this. Okay. And then shake hands, we'll go like this. All right. <laughs> All right. So that's for everyone here for achieving excellence. So thank just you. thank you for you and everyone in the community. Thank you very much. Um, and we're, we're not done, but we're done here on the, on the campus. Uh, and, sir, so we'll leave you a certificate that you can keep. And then. 
The next key player that really helped, which was amazing to me, I've worked on a several university campuses, I've taught at, a, at the military academy, and to allow us to work in a library, uh, I know how protective a library staff can be of their facilities, and I just want to say thank you publicly and ask um, on behalf of the entire staff if uh, Dean Scott's available to just come up and let me offer a small certificate. No, Stephanie's going to be here. I'm not Dean okay. Scott, but I'm representing her. Well, with thank pleasure. you. So uh, I'd like to hand you just a small symbol of thanks. It's amazing. So You're thank welcome. you. Thank you. So, it, allowing the Department of Army civilians into someone's library in their special collections room <laughs> to deliver services on seven days a week, 12 hours a day, that's amazing. So just thank you. Um, and then the other element that allowed us to come in was very helpful is the security section. I just want to recognize two people. So Chief Arnold, uh, um, for your entire section, a small certificate. So thank you. Thank you Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Oh, we've got to do a oh, second picture. We, we missed it. Okay. We're good? Okay. <laughs> Seconds of safety. Thank you, sir. And is Sergeant Mag Maddox here as well? No. Okay. Control, that was the other one that was recognized because I said you can only recognize two people on the team, uh, but they wanted to recognize your entire security section. Oh, thank uh, you. So that was. Sure that you thank you. And then we, they they fought. My staff fought me hard and asked for me to recognize three members of the facility staff. I don't know if they're here today, um, but it was Matt Christensen. Matt is here. Matt's here. Excellent. They all said fabulous things about you. They wouldn't tell me what you did, but they, they said thank you. <laughs> That's the one that worked best. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't know if Jane Morrison's here. I haven't met Jane, but I'll leave, I'll leave that one here. Or Heidi Jacks. So, so both of them were recognized. I just want to say that. Okay. So like I said, I don't get to thank everybody publicly, but I did ask them to highlight two people uh, from each section that they wanted me to recognize to you. So. Uh, on behalf of the Corps of Engineers, on behalf of FEMA, on behalf of the members of the community for allowing us to provide one aspect of service that will set them on a conditions to rebuild, thank you for hosting us here. Uh, and that's, that's really the message I like to deliver is just a massive thank you that the rest of the community may not see uh, what you allowed us to do out of here. So we're moving out, I think, on April 15th. Uh, so if that matches your timeline, uh, you may see a few more people around for a couple more days, but just truly thank you. Thank you, thank you for your support. You're welcome back anytime. Okay. <laughs> Under better circumstances, yeah, yeah. hopefully. All right, we move on to uh, eight public hearing. So we will move on to 8.1, public hearing. Excuse me, just one second. Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals Negotiation Initial Proposal, data 2013-2018. Public hearing is open. Does anyone wish to speak? Public hearing, 8.1, closed. 8.2, public hearing, Napa Valley Community College District initial proposal for negotiations with the Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals for the contract period beginning July 1, 2018. Public hearing open. Anyone wish to speak? Public hearing closed. And we shall move on to 9.1. Public comment. Public comment. At this time, the board will devote a total of up to 15 minutes for comments to the Board of Trustees regarding any subject not appearing as an agenda item for this meeting, but over which the board has jurisdiction. The public may ask the board to place an item related to the business of the district on a future board agenda. No action or discussion will occur at this time on such items. Individuals will be limited to a five-minute presentation. At this time, the board chair 
will pull those in attendance regarding the speak on the item on the agenda. Not on the agenda. I have cards for Gary Orton and Anthony Leo. Uh, Mr. Orton. Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw that. And a topic on Anthony Leo's Math Tutorials Center. Which item, which item was that that you'd like to speak on? Or would you like to speak now in public comment? I would love to just speak now in public comment. Okay, okay, that's, that's great, go ahead. Excellent, everyone, thank you. My name is Anthony Leo, good evening. I'm considered a non-traditional student as I have not been in the collegiate environment since 2004, almost 15 years now for me. This presents unique challenges and dynamics as I navigate my academic career, many of which I never could have anticipated, and math studies particularly create the most significant learning curve for me, myself, and many others. As a student here at Napa Valley College, I would like to take a moment this evening to champion the importance of our Math Lab Tutoring Center here on campus. The purpose of my speech this evening is to promote the Math Lab Tutoring Center and reiterate its importance to non-traditional students like myself. Additionally, I would like to briefly evaluate my experience thus far utilizing the resource. Students that have been away from the academic environment for some time struggle with math studies. Much of which is studied throughout our coursework is not, is not practiced in our professional lives, making it difficult to find a support community. Peers that have been sitting in math courses throughout their high school years may have an advantage over non-traditional students like myself. Mathematics studies, be it intermediate algebra, trigonometry, calculus, or statistics, all require hours and hours of practice and often deal in abstract, challenging theories that can be difficult to comprehend. Without a peer group to explore these ideas, the subject matter can often be dense and unclear, or even worse, intimidating and disconcerting. Non-traditional students often balance a myriad of adult life responsibilities Therefore, remaining familiar and in tune with these concepts can be very difficult. This brings me to an opportunity to describe how this resource has been beneficial to me. The Math Lab Tutoring Center has offered the community necessary to practice and learn the math studies I'm tasked with. I've been able to call upon both peer tutors and professional tutors that have helped me guide me through my math studies. As dozens of questions arise, these tutors apply their experience on the subject to equip us students with the tools necessary to be successful. Without this resource, I would undoubtedly find my math courses very much more challenging, and it is certain my grades would suffer in turn. The math, lab tutor, math Lab Tutoring Center is a very important resource that should continue to be invested in for our campus and student body. I'm an example of its success, and I'm grateful for the resource. Thank you all for your time this evening. I look forward to seeing this resource flourish for the sake of our, for the sake of our students in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. We have another speaker. I just got a card for Chris Malin. Good afternoon. My name's Chris Malin. I sort of live at 2945 Atlas Peak Road, but really at the Meritage right now. Um, and I'm here as the executive director to the Institute for Conservation Advocacy Research and Education. It's a nonprofit, local nonprofit. I started in 2004. Um, our board and our volunteers have been working on the health of the Napa River uh, since 1996. Um, and then we formed the nonprofit in 2004. We're the only nonprofit in Napa County that focuses on the health of the Napa River. Uh, and we do that by doing long-term biological um, assessment and monitoring of water quality and ecosystems. And in fact, our data uh, is uh, very rigorous and it is benthic macroinvertebrate sampling that we started in 1999 and went through 2006, overseen by Dr. Charlie Dewberry, who's a renowned scientist in the world. And he um, looked over our teams uh, as we collected the insects, the aquatic insects, and now our data is considered acceptable by the State Water Resource Control Board, and they helped us enter over 200 uh, data points, uh, benthic macaron data samples into their new uh, California environmental network um, uh, database uh, just over this last year because our, our data is so good. Um, <clears throat> so it will be used statewide and um, 
one of the things I came here to talk about is that um, I care, or this nonprofit, tracks the health of the Napa River. And you have part of Tula K Creek here, um, the northern part of your property. Um, has a, a remnant uh, part of the network of Tuloke Creek. Um, and uh, if you have any development going on in the future, it would be great if you think about restoration. Tuloke Creek has been highly degraded, um, but it still has um, a, a run of steelhead. And they go all the way up to Murphy Creek and Spencer Creek and uh, so keep in mind that you could be part of an overall restoration of the Napa River. Uh, one of the big concerns we have is that there was a new listing this year uh, for pollutants to the Napa River. Um, and uh, it comes under uh, the listing for pollutants is chloridane, DDT, dieldrin, PCPs, mercury, uh, and that's a pretty daunting concern. Uh, so this listing came in 2016 uh, by a group of scientists that monitored the Napa River and took samples. Now, all of these uh, pollutants I just men mentioned are um, as a result of pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, biocide use in the Napa watershed. So it is in the watershed, and we should be thinking about, uh, leaders in this valley should be thinking about helping to make the river a more healthy place. So uh, one of the things that I care does is we do educate the public, and um, we're, we've been actively commenting on the current listings of the Napa River for sediment, pathogens, and nutrients, and we follow the water board's planning uh, for cleaning up the river. So this listing was shocking. And I think the public should know about it. And I think that um, all of us have a responsibility to reduce pesticides, herbicides, biocides, insecticides, fungicides. And I know you have a vineyard here and you have the daycare center and you have students here and anytime you use any kind of chemical, whether it's by the label on the container or not, there's drift. Um, so um, I'm just here to ask you to think uh, about the future of how you impact the students and the children that are on the campus and think about going organic. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? All right. At this time, we'll close public comment on non-agenda items. We'll move on to constituent group reports, and we will start with Academic Senate report. Amanda Badger, please. Good evening, board. So even as I speak, uh, my colleagues from uh, other Senates across the state are currently in San Mateo, and I plan to join them shortly. Um, and at the spring 18 plenary session of the State Academic Senate, there are many matters of real pressing concern. Uh, among them, uh, some of you are quite familiar with the, um, the proposed online college. And to you, I nod, Marian. Um, so this is something that's being proposed as the 115th college in the system, 100% online. Um, it is a proposal that our state leaders in the Senate had hoped for more input, um, and there is, I'm guessing, an ongoing hope that there will be a sufficient faculty voice regarding exactly how this new college would, for example, have a governance system for faculty. Uh, among other rather hot topics would be AB 705. I suspect uh, you will be hearing more and more about that. It, at this point, is being uh, rolled out fall 19, and students seeking transfer will be expected to uh, perform successfully, complete successfully transfer or college level math and English within a year. This puts 
uh, our students who are accustomed to remediation, this means we will have to accommodate them in some considerable ways with wraparound services, co-requisites, all of that to be figured out. But uh, again, uh, a topic that is very much on the minds of my colleagues right now at plenary. I would also uh, say that here locally we are as busy. It's not quite as fraught, I'm happy to say. Um, we are, as a local senate here at the college, looking at, or hoping to look at very shortly, the latest iteration or revision of the tech plan. And we hope to be looking at that and uh, making recommendation, taking action very shortly. We are also, in conjunction with my colleague here to the right, looking at and revising our part-time evaluation process, part-time faculty evaluation process. Um, other uh, policies, which I hope will be making their way to shortly, will include academic freedom. And finally, um, I would like to just give a sort of update on our committee pilot. Uh, as we are coming to the end of the first year, uh, the Senate will continue for another year, as was approved last spring. Uh, we are, as uh, the work group that originally came up with the idea, we are responding to our colleagues' concerns about still some breaks in communication. So we're continuing to improve those. We are going to go back to two meetings a month in, in response to faculty concerns that they want to hear and have more opportunity to weigh in on whatever issues we're discussing. So um, I think at this point, uh, you will no doubt hear more from me about AB 705 and possibly Vice President uh, Scheer as well. So I will just choose to close right now. Thanks. Amanda, is that already passed legislation or is it being, is yes, legislation? It has passed. It has passed. And okay. what has happened most recently is a set of guidelines about exactly how it needs to, when and how it needs to be rolled out. Okay. And um, there might be more coming about that. Thank you. <coughs> Administrative Confidential Senate Report, Ken Arnold. Uh, hi, Ken Arnold. Uh, no report tonight. Okay, that's that's unusual, but we'll we'll accept oh, that. We'll no, accept no, that. All right. Thank you, Associate Student Students of Napa Valley College, Rafael Manzo. Good evening. Uh, yes. Uh, well, in the last month, um, I think our, our biggest accomplishments, uh, or rather things that I think uh, stood out for us in ASNVC, were um, our scholarship committee uh, met and you know set, uh, decided on uh, the recipients for um, the scholarship that we host in house, you know, so to speak. Um, it's the ASNVC scholarship. It's uh, students. If any a student who has ever served on ASNVC be it for half a term or a complete term, um, be it past years or this current year, et cetera, is eligible for it. So um, that's really our, our main criteria is that they be have served on ASMBC at some time. Um, and uh, we had our scholarship committee meet uh, for the to, to screen the applicants, and we've reached our decision on that, so that's great. It's always, it feels good to you know even provide that forward. Um, as those graduates move on. Um, and let's see, also uh, tonight, uh, as, it, as luck would have it, is um, we're hosting an event. It's the Napa uh, City Council candidate debate. So candidates who are running for City Council of Napa, um, some of our board members wanted to host a debate for them here on campus. They thought that, be a that the college would be a really appropriate venue for that. Um, you know, it's for the community and such. And uh, yeah, so that's happening right now, uh, as I'm afraid. Um, otherwise, and I'm sure many of you would have loved to attend, and I certainly would as well. 
Um, but uh, it, and it's really just that um, we initially we had planned a different day, but it didn't work out. So um, they moved it to the 12th, not realizing, oh, gee, that's the day of the board meeting. So uh, sorry. But um, I'm, I'm kind of checking in virtually, and I'm, I'm sure everything's going fine. <laughs> As a president, I can only hope so. Um, right. And let's see. Oh, of course, happy 75th anniversary. That's this Saturday. And I'm sure, I'm just getting here, but I'm sure several of you have already talked about it. And if not, it'll be brought up a lot tonight, I'm sure. Because, hey, happy 75th, right? I've got my pin on and everything. Um, and lastly, for my report, um, I will invite um, my coordinator, Benjamin, uh, to come up to the podium. And he and I will make a, a formal announcement. We have something special we'd like to say. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Benjamin Casada. I'm the coordinator of Student Life. I oversee student government, and I oversee the clubs here on campus. If I can motion over here to the side wall, you will notice there are two bronze plaques on display. Um, I would like to, at this point, formally acknowledge back in 2012, the student government made a decision to create a legacy project, and the legacy project was called the Student Activity Center. They wanted to put together a center which will allow students to get together, have fun, do games, have a place to lounge, some place that was weatherproof that they can uh, be able to coordinate with each other and just relax and have a nice place to, to do what they wanted to do, whether it be games or studying um, or eating their, their lunches there. So um, I would like to take this time to acknowledge student government, which had their first legacy project. This is their first legacy project. It will be completed next month. And so I want to give a big round to student government for their legacy project. So the, the plaque that will be on the left, um, which will acknowledge student government as a whole, the years that student government was involved, the names of the student, uh, student government presidents and the chairmen of that committee are so inscribed on that particular plaque. Now I'd like to give uh, this mic over to Ralph Almanzo, ASFC president. Thank you, Ben. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the current president uh, for just another couple of weeks, um, though elections are coming and those decisions will have to be made, and then June 1st, we'll see who's standing before you. Um, but right now, what I want to do is direct your attention to the second plaque on the right, uh, which acknowledges the foundation, of course, because that's what really helped finish out this legacy project, something that started in 2012 with uh, the student government of that time. They were called ASB, Associated Student Body. Now we think we're so cool with our new acronym, but not really. Um, no elitism here. Just um, And so uh, I just want to say that you know it's taken a long time, and it's gone through several phases. Um, what we might fix in that venue. It used to be the cafeteria. Um, I was a student here during that time, and we loved our cafeteria, but for several reasons, it's no longer the cafeteria. And so it was like, hey, we've got this place. It's always kind of been the hub for student um, lounging, and yeah, um, there's just a lot of buzz. So could we continue this legacy project and turn it into the Student Activity Center? And the Napa Valley College Foundation was the one that gave us this, um, much bigger than our budget could support anyway, um, a really generous donation um, of, of $30,000, and it really has made such a difference. And you can go in during the week, During let's be fair, during the week, when um, there's it's peak hours, and you will find people, absolute students um, of all sorts, um, including the police academy and nursing. I mean, everybody, all of, all of our students really make use of that venue, um, and they're using all the things in there, all the, the furniture, the ping pong tables, great exercise, and they get into it. <laughs> um, and um, the foosball and the air hockey, all the little recreational sort of games, but really just the sense of community. Um, it's the place. It's the place to go if you're not trying to be quiet, you're trying to unwind for the day. So that's what that second plaque really means is thank you, Foundation, for giving us that a, real, a big really powerful boost to finish up this project that would have otherwise taken us a long time in phases to complete. So um, we're just finishing out the work that started years ago in 2012, um, but it's, it's been a long time coming, and so we can't wait to have those up, mounted, and uh, really just as a symbol for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to add to that, Ben, you're awesome. Um, 
I happen to be connected on Facebook with Ben, and it's been all over the world, or all over the United States at least, with students at some point. Your work is amazing. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Classified Association Report, Jan Shart, who is not here. So we will move to, but Michael is, Classified Senate Report, Michael Rayford. Evening, everyone. Um, I've been off for like two months, off and on, uh, family issues and stuff. Uh, came back to the classified retreat and found out that nobody got release time to go to the retreat. So we had like 30 people show up. So I'm asking the board tonight and the administration, if we can work a deal where we have that day off in spring, on spring break, that Thursday, if we have the whole day off so that all the classified can attend the retreat. The retreat was, was well, well were accepted, but the problem was a lot of people didn't get a chance to go to the retreat. So that was their issues that they brought to us as a board. So hopefully next year will be a lot better. But uh, other than that, that was the only thing that we had over the time that I was gone. So that's all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Faculty Association Report, Christy Aumoto. Hello, everyone. Um, this week, we amended our bylaws. We, uh, our faculty association officers will now serve two-year terms as opposed to the previous one-year terms that they have served. We also today open nominations for all of our officer positions, and our election will be next month. Uh, next week, my lead negotiator and secretary and I will be attending a statewide union conference and I just wanted to note that our very own Forrest Quinlan will be receiving an award there based on his union service. Um, finally, the last meeting I made a statement about the need for clearer procedures and processes on our HR website. I wanted to follow up and let everyone know that this issue has been resolved. And thank you very much to the district and to the Human Resources Department, including Executive Director of Human Resources, Charu Alpuran, uh, for getting this done in the timeline that was promised. And we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. She's always so eager. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move to 11.1 .1 Napa Valley College Foundation Report. And Ann Branch is here. Yes, uh, good evening, board. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Um, in your packets tonight, you will notice that you will all have um, a copy of the annual report. And I wanted to thank the Office of Institutional Advancement, Carolee and Doug and Scott for all their help. They really, they did the majority of the work. And when I just started, I just sort of came in and finished it off. So I hope you enjoy the report. Um, the rest of it is pretty standard. So far we have our scholarship season underway. Um, it's, it's actually pretty much finished. We will announce the scholarship recipients the first week in May. And we've, during the gifts, we received a, a, an interesting um, gift from the Center for Volunteer and Nonprofit Leadership in Marin County. And I'm trying to locate them and find out who and how we got that gift. Um, we've gotten $50,000 with the annual appeal. And then one of our, our uh, he's an, actually a new board member, um, started a scholarship fund a couple years ago and is renewing that. On Saturday for the 75th, we are happy to announce that a, a beloved professor here, Chris Burdett, has made a $25,000 um, matching gift, so we're doing a campaign. And hopefully that runs through the end of December. We will, can raise $50,000 if we get that gift match, and that will celebrate sort of and recognize his 50 years of service here. So we'll be kicking that off on Saturday. Last, uh, last time we met, I, I uh, told you about two new board members that we voted in, and we also have two more that we are going to hopefully vote in um, at the end of April for our board meeting. Bill Hardy, who's president of the foundation, he and I participated in the North Bay Business Journal Community Philanthropy Awards event, and that was um, exciting. 
And we, I just had an article published in the Napa Valley Register a couple of weeks ago about post-relief and how some of our students were doing. So I think that's about it. Anything? Thank you. President cabinet, President's cabinet reports, and uh, um, thank you. Who do we want to start with? Um, let's let's start with Eric. I think you know, since you've had a busy day and you're back back here today tonight. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees. Um, so I've got a few things here for you tonight. Um, I've got a, f a fairly lengthy document for you that we've uploaded to the website with my report. Um, I won't go over every bit of this in detail, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of where we are right now. Um, first off, a snapshot on where we are relative to enrollment here at the college. So um, I gave a, an enrollment update back in February, I do believe, to the board. And uh, so I want to walk you through some of the things that we geek out on in my office on a regular basis as we're um, analyzing the student enrollment data every day as, and making decisions about scheduling for the coming year. So at this point, um, as of, and there's a, there's a double asterisk at the top of this. If you get down to the bottom of the second page, I want to be really clear about this part. This is not mature data that we're looking at. And so what I mean by that is that these numbers uh, are pretty volatile. They go up and down nearly every day. Um, so we don't really have a, a, a really clear picture of what happened until after the fact. So, but this, these are numbers that we monitor while we're in process during the semester to get a good sense of where we're at right now and to see if we can see any trends emerging from it. So first off, as of a few days ago, uh, we were up about half a percentage point in our enrollments. And enrollment, again, is a single, a single person in a single seat in a single section of a class. So one person may count for multiple enrollments depending on how many classes in which they are enrolled. The enrollment number, though, is a real critical one that we use at this stage of our analysis as we're looking at what we're going to be doing in the coming year for enrollment management. Uh, Headcount-wise, we're uh, down about a 1.5% uh, 1, 1 in headcount, that is uh, unduplicated headcount. So those are the individual students here. So the difference between those two numbers tells you that we have uh, slightly fewer students who are taking more classes, which is not a bad thing for us. Uh, the interesting thing on this first table, though, that I'll talk about the census state enrollment. So census state enrollment is a really good way for us to compare what ha is happening now to what happened exactly one year ago on the same date. Census date is the Monday, typically of the fourth week of the semester, or 20% of the way through the term. Uh, we were down about 2.87%. Um, as of uh, census date last month. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that if you look at the difference between the 2.87 and the 0.42 that we're up right now, what that means is that, is that more students have been retained at this point, which is actually a really good number to be looking at in the data set at this point. Again, this is not mature data. We don't know exactly where it's going to end up for the term, but it's pointing in a good direction for us in terms of the students who are here staying here. Um, an increased uh, persistent, or pardon me, an increased retention rate is always something that we're looking for as a college. So there's a little bit of verbiage about that down below. If you scroll down the page a little bit, a few other numbers that we're looking at to give you a sense of what we're doing. Um, these are some other enrollment figures that we look at and monitor during the semester. Some of these are directly related to the schedule that we've built. And so I'd like to draw your attention down to the number of sections and then the, the line below it, the number of sections that are cross-list adjusted is what that uh, verbiage means. This is how many schedule, uh, how many sections of courses we built when we developed the schedule for this semester. So what you're going to see here is that we that we deliberately built a slightly smaller schedule this semester than we had one year ago during this time. What we're doing when we're when we're looking at this is trying to hit that sweet spot where we're getting student demand in line with the number of classes that we're offering. And so um, that we reduced by 4.5% after we do the cross-list cross list adjusted, but we're only down a tiny bit in the enrollment is actually a really good thing. What that means is that we are running what we would call a more efficient schedule, meaning that it costs less to do the schedule that we're doing right now than it cost one year ago because we have fewer class sections and more students in each one of those class sections. So this is some of the, some of the information that my deans and I look at on a regular basis and that we check almost every day in the Office of Instruction while we're going along. Um, the picture with all of this is that, is that um, even with uh, slightly fewer students, with them enrolled in more courses, this keeps our full-time equivalent student number stable. And that's really what we're looking for overall. 
and I can talk to you about full-time equivalent student number on another, uh, another occasion. I want to help you get on with your board meeting here. Um, a couple of other things on that with the enrollment. So um, it's one thing to look at the overall picture of how enrollments are going across the campus and how we've been scheduling across the campus. The part where it gets more important for us in the Office of Instruction is looking at how that's actually functioning at the level of a department, even at the level of a, sec a course section, um, the level of one of our academic divisions. And so what we see when we look at that is that is that it's not the same picture across the board. So if we're down by 0.5% or 2% in enrollment, or if we're up by 2% in enrollment, that doesn't mean that every single program looks like that. And so in fact, in some of the programs that we have, that I have listed here on this next page, some of these have increased in enrollment over the past two years by upwards of 50%. And so it's an interesting picture when we look at it because those numbers start to tell us what students are interested in and where we're most effectively serving students. And they give us an indication of the decisions that we need to make going forward in terms of how we schedule for the coming year. So these are other, th these are other things that we look at as we're looking through the enrollment picture. Um, and then finally, on the, on the enrollment note, um, so some of the declines uh, actually reflect a lot of the state data that's happening right now. Specifically, um, we see declines in student enrollments in some areas that were affected by the change to the state regulation in 2012 that eliminated the ability of students to repeat courses endlessly. And so that's an expected drop that's been happening around the state. And so our data actually mirrors pretty well. One thing I will say too is that I've been at actually at the Chief Instructional Officers Conference for the last couple of days and I'm driving back to San Francisco uh, tonight as soon as, as soon as we're done here to join my colleagues again. Uh, we're looking really good in Napa right now. Um, our, sur uh, our surrounding colleges are experiencing enrollment declines of upwards of 10%. Um, and this is, that's pretty, a pretty standard number around the state right now with the exception of a couple of overachievers in Southern California that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, so, so in Northern California right now, the picture for most schools is that there's a slight dip in, in, in enrollment. And the thing is, this is normal and this is cyclical. This is what happens in, in our state. Economy gets a little bit better, enrollments go down a little bit. Economy gets a little bit worse, enrollments tend to go up a little bit. Um, so those of you who have been around the community college system for a while know that these are the things that we're, that we're always looking at. But I thought I would just share with the board a little bit of where we're at right now and just give you a window on what we're looking at. A couple of other quick things for you here tonight on my report. Um, uh, the academic affairs area has been working diligently on our annual unit plan and budget. This year too, one of the things that we're doing in all of the areas that the college are doing right now is developing a three-year uh, three strategic goals that are based on the strategic plan that you as a board approved last, uh, last fall. So our instruction council, my deans and division chairs and I have been working on the strategic goals for instruction for the coming three years and um, working with the, in, uh, with the research planning institutional effective off effectiveness office um, to set up some specific measures for how we're going to measure those goals in the coming years. We're really excited about the direction we're taking with them. AB 705 implementation. So uh, my colleague on the Academic Senate already touched on this a little bit. This is the hot conversation around the state right now and has uh, dominated most of the conversations at the Chief Instructional Officers Conference over the last couple of days. And we're going to be continuing those conversations tomorrow. Uh, with the Executive Vice Chancellor for the California Community College System, Dr. Laura Hope. Um, this, is a, this is a pretty significant thing that we're sitting on top of right now and that we're looking at. This is a pretty major, ref uh, this is a major reform effort. And for those of you that play along with what the Assembly does, this is a AB Assembly Bill 705 was put forward by Jackie Irwin out of Ventura County. Um, and this was an amendment to the Student Success Act. And specifically, this, uh, this new assembly bill is targeting how we deliver and how we place students into English and math uh, at the collegiate level. And it is a pretty significant attempt to reform the remedial sequence, that is the pre-collegiate sequence of English and math that gets students up to transfer level. Um, so, been in, in conversation with, uh, with faculty in the English and Math Department. We're really kind of waiting to see where all of this shakes out. Um, we've, we had a guidance memo that came out a couple of weeks ago that uh, seemed to go perhaps a bit beyond what the law did um, in terms of the guidance that it gave us. But wherever this shakes out, 
Napa Valley College could be sitting, sitting in, a really, uh, in a really interesting position in a couple of years, depending on how our local faculty decide to go about working on the implementation of this. Um, the models that were being pointed towards uh, include a lot of additional services, tutoring services, so the math tutoring center that was mentioned earlier tonight, um, expanded tutoring services, expanded courses that are co-requisites to those transfer level courses. A lot of those models that are out there are gonna require a lot more resources of the college and, and we are looking at having to devote more resources into those areas. Uh, this also has a pretty significant impact for us in scheduling courses and in the room availability that we have as well because as soon as you have co-requisite courses, you've doubled the number of, of course sections that you offer in a given semester because no longer is the student just enrolled in the English 120 course, they're also enrolled in a co-requisite course at the same time. And so we're tracking this pretty closely to see what adjustments we're going to need to make, but I would expect that over this next year as we work through what this actually means, what we actually do here at the college in response, um, we'll, be, we'll be making a lot of adjustments to how we're doing our planning for next year and how we're looking at our budgets uh, going forward into the 2019-2020 academic year as we're anticipating and, and adjusting to accommodate what be, may be a new reality for us in delivering services to students in these two particular disciplines. The last thing I'll say on that particular point is that this is, again, an academic and professional matter that we are in the middle of. The role of the administration is really to support the faculty and to help guide compliance, but really the tough decisions and the tough work are going to be done by the faculty that actually have to look at the curriculum and do the sequencing and deliver the services and education to our students. Um, finally, guided pathways. Um, we have uh, submitted our grant for guided pathways. I've talked about this a couple of times uh, at, at here at the at, in my board report. Um, so our our cross functional work group, I think is the term that we're supposed to be using under Guided Pathways for that, that uh, consists of representatives from the Academic Senate, Student Affairs, and from uh, the Office of Instruction, put together our multi-year plan, submitted it to the state, and the grant money should be coming soon. Uh, very small grant associated with it, but there's gonna be a lot of discussion and work about, on this in the coming year, and you'll hear more from us at a later date. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. A lot of information and, and wonderfully done. Thank you. I Good luck on the question. on the rest. Yes, sounds like you have a question. Uh, yeah. yeah so of the um, programs that are in showing increased enrollment, uh, the group that you have bulleted there, are there is there enrollment that we are not able to accommodate? Are we able to accept all that enrollment or? Can oh, no, there, there, there's plenty of enrollment that we're leaving on the table right now um, okay. um, in some of the key areas, chemistry being one of, the, one of the big ones that we look at here on this particular list. Um, the demand for chemistry, because it, those are courses that serve multiple other degrees, um, they are key courses in our gateway into our um, allied health programs. Uh, the demand far outstrips the availability in, in that particular area. The same would be true. Um, in some of the other areas that are that are very lab centric or where they need specific types of facilities uh, to be able to deliver the instruction um, so those tend to only be able to grow to the size of the of the space that they actually occupy so what do we do with those uh, what is our process with the students that we can't accommodate are we seeing them come back or what I mean, we hope we have such. <laughs> we don't. We don't want to send them to Solano Community College, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. So sometimes it can take several semesters for students to get into some of these key classes because, again, the demand far outstrips what we're actually able to offer. And in some instances, uh, the, the, there's, there's facilities issues, but in some instances, like in math, we don't have enough instructors and we can't get enough adjuncts to fill all of, the, all of the sections that we could possibly offer in any given semester. And so there's also an issue that comes up with actually just being able to get people to teach the classes and to get enough instructors in front of the students. And so there's a variety of reasons for it, but many of the ones that you see on here are facilities related. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Ron. Thank you. Um, Vice President Daharo. Thank you. In, in, in my report, you'll see there's a, there's a listing 
uh, the several services that uh, several, several activities that are being offered, being provided by services within student affairs. Uh, there's some that, that I that I would like to uh, uh, to, uh, to to highlight. One is that um, the the effort that that we're having with reference to inviting colleges or inviting schools, should say, to visit our our, our campus has extended all the way to West Sacramento. Uh, earlier this month, we had we had a grade school uh, Bridgeway uh, that that came to vi visit us, and uh, they had a great day. It, w it was it was a great experience, and that just shows, uh, I guess the. The, the extension of, of our of our limb, if you will, of the college, uh, re reaching out and being exposed to to other parts of of, of our northern state. Um, also, uh, early, early this month, uh, Dr. Dr. Kraft uh, and I met with uh, with Wade, Wade Roach of the school district because, as you know, we have uh, four locations or four sites: at American High, American, American uh, College, American Canyon uh, High School. We have three classrooms and one office space. One thing that we don't have is signage. And I think it's imperative that we have a signage to make to make certain that that both the public as well as our students there understand that we are a partner with that particular school. So we are working on on some signage. We're not certain what exactly it'll, it'll look like, other than we're hoping it'll be very visible and uh, electronic as well. Um, another another uh, uh, joint venture that we've just that we just entered to, and with is is is, is Camille uh, Creek School. It's it's community school. And what we're doing with, with this particular group of individuals, students, is that we're offering a counseling class, Counseling 92. They'll be on campus. They have been on campus uh, twice already. It's a, it's a four-Friday visit where be, uh, they'll be sitting in, in a, an orientation class to prepare them for the enrollment at Valley College for the fall semester. Um, along with that, uh, we're also having a tour of New, New Tech High School. But in this case, there are actually there, there, there are two tours of that particular school. 40 students or 45 students or so will be attending a tour of the campus of the main campus, and another 40 students from that particular high school will be attending a tour of, of the Valley campus. Uh, these, are, these students are interested in seeing all the variety of services that we have to offer at Navajo Valley College, and uh, they've asked us to, to provide them that, that tour, and we we're very happy to do so. Um, the other uh, event, as you know, and I think it's, it's been mentioned uh, on, on several occasions, is that next Thursday, we have the 30th annual uh, uh, high school breakfast. It's an event that's that's been inactive uh, for for 13 years, and I've attached a couple of, of, of data pieces here um, down right there with with a breakdown of schools. Uh -huh. uh, this is just to show you the the number of high schools and agencies that will be here next week. Uh, there'll be 26 uh, high schools, and there'll be uh, schools from four different counties: Napa County, Solano County. Uh, Sonoma County and uh, Marin County. So again, this 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 activity is gaining a lot of, uh, I guess, a momentum, uh, a lot of publicity to the point where where high schools from other areas are are wanting to to attend. But I also want to make uh, one thing very very clear: this 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 activity for 13 years has been successful only because of the partnership we have with 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 instruction, the office of instruction. Uh, the the CTE per, uh, pro, uh, program has been very cooperative with with making certain that that what we shared this day is uh, both academic as well as services related. And uh, Dan Shabodi, I, I want to thank you very much for for this year for for your participation and and, and your assistance with with this event. Um, we're planning on 91 guests uh, as well as another 60 or so staff members. I know that there's three or four of you from the board we have reserved, and if you have reserved, uh, it's too late. But anyway, but maybe for uh, and maybe for a fee, we can uh, we accommodate you in the, in the seats there. But, uh, but lastly, I just want to thank you very much for um, for for uh, reviewing this, these these reports, and and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Bob, did you have a report tonight? I do not have a report tonight. Okay. And you, yeah, you're gonna have plenty of time. I think. I'll, you'll hear me. Yeah. Um, Charo Albaran, uh, the executive director of HR, has something for us to see. Thank you, Charles. Okay. No, you're fine. Good, thank you. I'll take it. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Kraft, and my fellow board of trustees. 
My name for the audience, my name is Charo Abaran. I'm the Executive Director of Human Resources, and I am proud to introduce a new hot button on our homepage, Title IX. Title IX is actually a federal civil rights law um, that was passed back in 1972. As employees, um, whether we're administrators, classified, faculty, we all have a responsibility under Title IX. Title IX protects everyone against gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual violence. And it's very important, not only is it important, but it's also required that we have this button on our, on our homepage um, so that students who feel that they have been violated under Title IX know exactly where to go for support. So I'm going to click the button and it takes us to a landing page. The first thing I want to showcase is the resources. Oh, this moves. This is great. I don't need the mouse. I'm so used to this. So there you see someone who kind of looks like me, but the picture looks way better than uh, the person standing in front of you. And then the person next to me, um, uh, Mr. Dejaro, um, both of us are serving as um, Title IX coordinators for the district. Um, Oscar um, will be handling all Title IX complaints that are student on student complaints. It's important that that role falls under student affairs because it could potentially lead to student discipline. All other issues, issues involving student and faculty, student and staff, faculty and faculty, staff on staff, those things are reported directly to me. So on our website, we've listed um, several resources, both um, in-house as well as local resources for folks to reach out to should they need, should they have a need. Additionally, I'm not going to go over every button. Close the window. Close the window. What we listed here is ways that um, folks can report an incident and some additional information that is really needed for the reporting party and also the responding party and also providing information for mandatory reporting. So what I want to point out is over the next year, Oscar and I will be focused on um, continually developing the Title IX program for the campus, um, improving um, the resources available to the entire community and bringing training specifically to students over this next year. I want to point out something that I know um, Trustee Martheson pointed out for me and I want to make sure I make note of it. Our board policy D1130, which is our um, our board policy that speaks to unlawful discrimination along with the ARs will be live on our, um, under our board policy page very shortly. But the ARs and the board policy is located here on the Title IX landing page. Um, thank you. I, I really appreciate um, you having this place that students can go to to file a complaint. The only, if I, I can make a suggestion, if I was a student, I wouldn't know to click onto Title IX, do you know what I mean, because I have I've been harassed or I've been discriminated against. So I don't know if it could be maybe a question like, have you been discriminated against, press here, or something, because most students don't know what Title IX is, so they wouldn't know to go there to file a complaint. So just a thought to make I, it more clear. I really appreciate that feedback, and actually, um, this is... This is a definitely a great start for us, yeah, no, it's fabulous. and um, a lot of other districts has a very small link at the very bottom of their web page. And so we are, over the year, we're going to be working on this and continually building on this. I think it's perfect. I think maybe just a question right above Title IX, just have you been discriminated against, and then they click on that. It would be awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. 
And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Charles. Thank, Thank you. you. No applause. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. I, yeah, I, I love it. Um, we have, I call on Doug Ernst right now, the public information officer report, please. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard about the um, clipping service uh, today. Uh, I offer not just the newspaper clippings, but also uh, magazines. Uh, we've got the Marketplace magazine doing a couple of features. Um, one on the College 75th, uh, this one here uh, from Humble Beginnings. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we're expanding uh, our coverage to include uh, radio. We've had a couple of interviews on the radio. Uh, Dr. Kraft, uh, Scott Allen have been on the radio. And uh, Napa Broadcasting also. Amazing. So uh, we're, we're expanding our reach beyond the register. Um, on that uh, topic about the uh, radio interviews, they're, they're really about the 75th anniversary, and I'd like to move to the program that, uh, yes, yeah, this is a summary of, of months of work by uh, staff, uh, hours and hours of uh, painstaking effort to get the right people here. Um, we might have a thousand people, I don't know. But what I want to bring your attention to is the opening ceremony. Uh, we're going to have uh, elected officials and proclamations. And, and at noon, it would really be great if all of you were there for the photo, the, the group photo of elected officials. We've invited, we've, we've enticed elected officials to come here by saying, be sure you're there at noon for the, uh, the group photo. And I'd, I'd love to see you all there. We have t-shirts for you. You don't have to wear them for the group photo. But there they are. We, we would love to see you at the event. We'd love to see you with the t-shirts. And uh, it's an important event for the college uh, in that you're going to have people here coming to the college for the first time, looking around saying, oh, this is what the college is. What do you do here? And we're going to have places for them to go and things to see. So it would be great for them to see the electeds also. Um, also, uh, what we're doing is a uh, speakers bureau. And um, these are just some of the organizations that, uh, that we're going to reach out to. Five of them we've already done, right up there. Uh, the next page will show the ones that we've already scheduled in the next uh, two or three months. And the next page are uh, organizations we're going to speak to. We're still working on them, uh, you know, matching speakers with dates. So uh, th th quite, a, quite a coverage, you know, from American Canyon to Calistoga. Uh, we're very looking forward to telling people what we're up to. The uh, last thing I just, just want to mention is on April uh, 27th, we're going to have a luncheon, a classified luncheon in the, in the Glade. In the Glade. Uh, we'd love to have you there, too. Thank you. Yeah, please. Well, thank you for your work on the... 75th and I'll be there and look forward to it. Um, I just had one question. It's actually more for Dr. Kraft. I think I saw the article about the Silverado's um, opening in both the marketplace and in the register and there was no mention of the college in the articles or in their logo and I'm just wondering do we know when they're going to start promoting the college since that's part of the condition for using the, the field? I, I don't have a specific answer to your question. Carolyn might be able to better inform us. Um, we have a founding member sponsorship agreement with them, and it does not say that they are required to mention us in newspaper. or um, their, load, their pictures or anything? Well, we're on their website. We'll be on all their signage. Uh, we'll be in their social media. Um, but yeah, not their press coverage necessarily. Okay, okay. thank you. We do. I, I have um, been interviewed along with many other people for a, um, one um, magazine article that's coming out, and the college is quite prominent in, in that. And it's a national magazine, so um, we should get some good press, I think, from that. Because yeah, yeah, we figure that it's like forty-one thousand in advertising they're supposed to provide. So it seems exactly. like any opportunity to get our name in there. Exactly right. Thanks. Um, thank you, Doug. Heather, are you good? One more. Mm -hmm. No. 
Under 75th, the last slide. On here? There? But wait, there's more, right? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Community feedback survey, we had 149 responses. And this is an example of the kind of feedback we're getting. This is a survey that we're, we're sending out via email and, and regular U.S. post office mail right. as well? Going out Monday. Okay, good. Thank you. This is an ongoing effort as well. Do you mind explaining um, what the graph actually means? So. <laughs> sure. Um, just a snapshot of where we were at that time, um, but it shows that there are nearly four stars out of five given by the 149 respondents. So, and then um, there is a mailer going out on Monday to 25,000 uh, community members. And Carolee, how long will it, this survey we intend on keeping open for quite a while, right, so we can get lots of feedback? Yeah, through the summer probably. Thank you. So we'll move on to um, the president's report. If we can do open that, Catherine. A couple things, um, you know, generally from the state side, I'd like to report a few things. Um, first, there's a, there was a proposal for a new college funding formula, which is very important for colleges generally up and down the state. We vary so much from a, from a smaller rural college like Napa to a big Southern California multi-college district. So you can imagine that one size fits all of a new funding formula was not received well by the field. So when the chancellor um, kind of rolled this thought process out, um, they organized a CEO work group, formula work group, and working kind of hand in glove with uh, Bob's side of the house with, on finance as well. And they've come up with some recommendations, which uh, include really um, taking a good long look at base funding, trying to analyze uh, what I'll call the bigger moves. There are so many uh, unfunded uh, um, mandates or mandates that are really changing the name of the game and how we address our students. And Amanda has talked about it and Eric. So we're still kind of working through. It's going to take... Um, um, facilities and infrastructure. It's also going to take a more faculty and support services. So um, we're, as a CEO group, trying to um, really understand that process so we don't kind of rush that too fast. And that link is there for you. Um, good news today was the enhancing student transfer from the um, community colleges to the um, UC system. Um, it, it made the papers in several places today, and I have some links there for you. We've had the ADT kind of transfer path to the um, CSUs, and it's been very, very well accepted. Um, now the UCs have kind of come on board, so our transfer students, the students who are um, receiving degrees or and wanting to continue onto a four-year or especially a research, this is a great pathway. Um, they also have a term called pathways, which they refer to their 21 kind of subject areas. Um, so this is good news, and it's, it's a very comprehensive piece um, good reading, but bottom line, I think I've, I've laid it there for you, their, their overarching piece from the UC system, and it's taken a while for them to get here, is recognizing that an associate degree is a significant milestone value by students and their families. They recognize that it's in their best interest to have the community colleges um, continue to provide the services that we do so students can afford if you will, at least the last two years of, of a, uh, a degree. So um, very exciting breakthrough. It's taken years of conversation for this to happen. A lot of success here. Um, at the um, president's staff meeting, we, we did a round table, and I just, I just put some in here. There's so many good things happening right now. Upper Valley Campus has a um, Napa Valley Vintners providing a candidate forum coming up. Sonoma State University continues its executive MBA on our campus. A, a lot more outreach to the eight to 12 teens and kids, if you will, for boot camps and summer educational camps, um, both here on the main campus and up, up Valley. That gets in the mind of those middle school students and high school students that college is not scary. 
It's a good place to be, and um, it's very obtainable for them. And then we have the ever-popular Spring Restaurant, Upper Valley, the Culinary Cooking School. If you want to go to that, you need to get on that fast because it fills. Career and technical, great. Uh, um, kudos to those folks. And I, I put a link in there, I, and I printed some of this out. Thank you, Diana, for sending this over. But the college has really um, overachieved again, receiving nine um, bronze and silver stars, if you will, for viticulture enology in the wine business. 72% of students attain the regional living wage. Child development and, and early education care, 100% of our students are employed in a job similar. Administrative justice, 93% um, recognize an increase in earnings. Psych tech, 329% increase in earnings, and 85% of our students attain the regional living wage. Law enforcement, 83 increase in earnings, and 86 of students attain the regional living wage. Paramedics, 75%. 82%. Nursing, 57% er, um, increase in earnings and 75% students. So these are really, this is good news, good data and good metrics. Um, the bottom line is it's smart to go to a community college and the answer is yes. Um, the, I think a little farther down here, thank you. Um, some other things that are happening. Um, uh, the Performing Arts Center, I see Michelle Mano out there today, yeah, um, is um, reported that this, this was a dream a little bit um, when we came in in 2012 and 13 to have this statement, the building is being used at capacity for instruction and for community partnership events. Um, it's wonderful. Our outreach now is for civic engagement, other groups, instruction clearly is the, is the reason for the building, so that's the most important piece. And then other performances that are co-curricular or um, of a nature that really add value. Um, we have integrated one of our programs, the viticulture program, the winemaking, to offer um, at some intermissions the um, uh, wine tasting of the college uh, estate wines, highly rated by the other Bob Parker. Um, and. Um, there's a little picture there. A STEM team reported they took a group of students, wonderful, to leadership retreat in Santa Cruz. Again, exposing transfer students, academically you know, oriented students who are really looking for a, a, a degree in science, technology, engineering, and math to other universities and, and colleges, wonderful. And um, you may have seen, if you have not seen it, uh, there's a picture, there's a Bracero installation in this building in, in the lobby. And um, if on your way out you get a chance to take a look at it, it's quite extraordinary. Um, I really give a, a, a shout out here to Dean Michelle Mano and VP um, Eric Shearer, and along with NVC staff and faculty students. And the exhibit was a supplement to the Smithsonian exhibition by focusing on how Braceros helped save Napa's ab agriculture during World War II and how they contribute and continue to contribute through the Latino um, um, groups in the valley um, to our ag um, um, business and, and just the, the overall regional piece. Oscar had a uh, personal story in that and I, I appreciate that, so did Rosada and, um, and, uh, and other people um, who are here. So take a look. It's the first of many um, accolades. And I believe that takes me to just, there was a, a small selection, as there always is, to folks that I meet with and outside pieces, um, and you're um, very willing to look at that. Um, PTK is the Phi Theta Kappa. Um, we had two um, all academy, um, all state uh, winners this year. Um, let me see if I can get to my names here so I'm good. Um, Siziki um, Hernandez, shown here as president um, of PTK and um, was honored along with Christopher Beller. This is, this is really a big news because when you're talking about California, the biggest system in, in the world, you're talking only 100 or so students are chosen from that. They were all in this room. We had two from Napa, so it's quite extraordinary. At that same meeting, our own Kathy Gillis, professor, um, was honored with a PTK 15-year service um, pen and um, we're very proud of the work that she does and how um, oriented she is. So thank you very much, and, and we are there. All great news. Yeah. Congratulations to our CTE programs. Um, and as we noticed on 
Eric's report. Those are some of the programs where we're, uh, we could have more people, so, um, but great, great news, and the exhibit outside is incredible. I saw this woman's face and thought it was Rosada's, and it was actually Oscar's mother, but her aunt, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're beautiful photos. And they, that would include Trusty Rios as well. Yeah, your father, right? Yes, and I'm sorry oh, that I, I missed that because that. I was thinking it while I was going through. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. All right, we'll move on to 12.1 minutes. Uh, there is an update. So we will uh, approve the minutes with an amendment or a correction on 14.3 the refund existing Series C bond. Uh, the correction is that uh, Trustee Martinson voted yay, and uh, the student trustee, Manvir Sandhu, voted nay. And uh, you trustee- You voted to abstain. You abstained. Manvir. Oh, I'm sorry. Abstained. So if we uh, could approve the minutes with that correction. Move approval. Second. I thought we were just moving. Aren't we doing it with consensus? I was going to, but since Trustee Baldini moved to approve, we'll go ahead and carry through. All right. <laughs> and there was a second from Rios? Rios. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? All right. Okay. Minutes pass. Thank you. Now we have a pro uh, presentation on bond feasibility 13.1. Um, I don't believe, no, I do not have any public comment on that. So uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, but maybe we do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've been here before. My name is Jack Gray, and I'm a <clears throat> director on the Napa County Taxpayers Association. And I wanted to comment on 13.1. And specifically to the trustees, and if, I, if you have not looked at this morning's uh, editorial page in the register, you will see an article by Dan Walters in there. And his article is on bond measures, school bond measures. And it has some important information in there that you need to consider in relation to this agenda item. Specifically, he's, he points out that bond language is required now by a state law to be true and impartial synopsis. In a language that is neither argumentative nor likely to be, create prejudices either for or against the bond measure. And he points out some of the things that show up in school bond measures. Money is needed to improve facilities. That shows up frequently. Fixing leaking roofs, common in bond measures for schools, and has been used here multiple times in Napa Valley College. Now, the other thing that is important for the trustees to consider, the law now requires not only that you have a facilities master plan, you need to have individual facilities identified with cost estimates. So you need to consider that if you decide to go for a bond measure now because it's required by California law. That's all I have. Thank you. I'm gonna step up to that. Podium there. Okay. Um, Bob and I will step over the podium and deal with it a little bit. Let me. Um, Bob is going to work through the a, a proposed project list, but I wanted to just. Um, take our attention to an all staff um, um, kind of bond e email information, the feasibility 
um, for you and land on a, a couple different things for the board and, and the audience here. Um, over the past two years, I'm not going to read this all, but just allude to it, the Board of Trustees has been gathering information, researching and analyzing the value of, of a general obligation bond. And so we're, we're continuing on that. It is the primary source um, uh, for capital construction and for major building modifications and um, in support services and infrastructure, as we've talked about. I also wanted to point to our work together here as a college, which was one of the important aspects of the Gabi um, post-analytic report in 14, which was a completion of detailed um, items, which we're, uh, we'll acquaint you with tonight, um, especially a participatory and, and um, very open, transparent conversation, which we have done so far. So let me, let me work you through. Educational master plan we worked on together as an institution in 13 and an update in 16. And the, a new facilities master plan we completed in 17. Comprehensive budget and forecasts in 17, all leading up to this finalizing the technology plan. You'll see a bit of that technology plan tonight and we'll come back at the May meeting with um, the specifics and um, some details in terms of costs. So we've spent our time preparing these documents, and I think this is important down here. The, I come from a, a background that is business trained. Um, I'm, I taught business. I know business. I know my way around spreadsheets. Um, this prudent and reasonable assessment is, is, is an important aspect to really deal with. So I don't take this lightly. We're not moving into it in a rush. Um, as we've said, we've taken several years to analyze this, and we're continuing the work together. Um, that's this inclusivity and transparency as our work together. Um, and this last part that I would want to say is the, the facilities master plan is a, a as um, Leon and Jack have, have talked about, is a, you know, and we have acknowledged is a broad framework. Um, so to really get to a specific piece, um, we're, we're, we created a project list um, that would be um, comprehensive, inclusive, um, understand the needs of the college moving through um, the, the past, the present, and the future. We focused a bit on the past tonight, the 75-year anniversary, also where we are. Um, now we need to shift our thinking to our, our current pieces and the future of the college for the next 50 years. Um, and that's an important piece, I think, Rafael um, Monzo, our, our ASNBC student, alluded to that. They're doing things um, in 2012 for the students who are here now. Now, he's happened to be um, lucky enough to hang out. Um, but, um, you know, some of, the, some of the pieces that we're working on now are legacy pieces that will empower those students who are now in kindergarten and who will come to Napa Valley College um, in, you know, 10 or 15 years and find it worthy of their education. So with that, I want to shift a little bit. Do I just close this doc up here? Nope, back. This one, thank you. Don't want to do the bad thing here. Okay, so I'm going to hand this off to Bob, and, and um, Matt is here as well. We can walk through, and um, Bob is going to take us through, and then we'll answer you know, some, some general questions at this piece and talk about the next step as well. Great, thank you. So um, Matt is here tonight to help me with this presentation. He's actually, I think, he volunteered to um, play Vanna White tonight. As you notice, we have some uh, maps of the campus on the wall. Uh, Matt has brought his big stick with him to point out certain areas of campus when we start talking about, you know, we, we talk about the 200 building, the 1800 building, the 2200 building. We are very familiar with where they are, but we just want to make sure that we're um, helping you locate where these things will happen on campus. And Matt also has his stick to poke Eric and Oscar if they start to nod off during this presentation. So we had, um, get two page down, and so the facilities master plan is, uh, was developed to guide us through future development. It 
was driven by the educational master plan, as you know, and it serves as our long range planning tool. And Matt and the facilities committee worked tirelessly to get uh, campus input on the facilities master plan as we developed that and finalized it in 2017. As we look moving forward, you will see that tonight's project list, which is the result of many meetings that were held on campus and many surveys that were completed and lots of input from our uh, constituent groups on campus. It's grouped into, into themes that came out of those meetings and out of the surveys, uh, both of, of voters as well as surveys of people on campus. And so you'll see that the buildings are grouped into the categories of repair and upgrade job training classrooms, modernized classrooms for job training in technology, computers, and engineering, modernize and update science labs, continue to maintain buildings, update the classrooms to meet current codes, improve student services, and then there's a category at the very end, campus-wide projects that address infrastructure and other items that impact the entire campus. And so moving into the various buildings, this is a new building. It falls under the category of improved student <laughs> services. It's the 1100 building. New construction will be the student center. And it really takes the place of where the bookstore currently is located, where EOPS and financial aid are located, and also fills in the quad area between those two buildings. It is a total of 61,000 square feet. It's a three-story building. It also retains what used to be the cafeteria is now the student activity center and the kitchen area. And we'll see on an upcoming slide what will happen to those areas. What will be incorporated or included in the 1100 building is the Welcome Center, Admissions and Records, Financial Aid, Counseling, Career and Transfer Center, Educational Talent Search. Those are things that are currently located in the 1300 building or the existing 1100 building. But then it incorporates the Veterans Center, so a, a better space for the Veterans Center, moving the Cultural Center into this area, EOPS, CalWORKs, and Foster Youth. DSPS will move into this building, so come out of the library and move into this building. Triple S Trio will be in this building. There will be some shared conference space. The Student Success Centers will move into this building, so the Math Success Center that we heard about earlier tonight, and the Writing Center will move into this building and get expanded space. The Assistant Superintendent VP of Student Affairs will be in this building. The Dean of Student Affairs will be in this building. Human Services, Health Services, the Bookstore, and the Placement and Tutoring Center. There are a couple of things that are not on this list but are included in this building, and that is the Student Activity Center and the offices for ASNVC and Student Life the Umoja program and the Puente program. Those will all be in this building. Retaining the former kitchen and cafeteria space in the 900 building, that's an existing building. And so we will be making improvements to that building, roofing components, entrance, door, entrance doors and frames, windows, interior doors, plumbing and electrical systems. The most important thing is that we would renovate and reconfigure this kitchen area and the hospitality classroom area to better serve the needs of the hospitality program and to give us the opportunity to increase uh, food services on uh, campus for our students. EOPS and DSPS got carried over from the previous slide. They're, they're not in two places. They're actually in the 1100 building. Moving on to our category of repair and upgrading job training classrooms, the Viticulture and Winery Technology Program will get some renovations and some additional space. And you've seen a presentation in the past that um, the uh, Napa Valley College Foundation is uh, embarking on a capital campaign to raise money to fund this project, but it is part of our facilities master plan and part of our overall project list. It involves constructing 6,000 additional square feet of flexible classroom space, creating a fully equipped laboratory, 
creating a tasting room and a wine sales training facility, additional storage, and a common gathering area for students. Another new construction building would be the 200 building. And Matt is pointing out to us that the 200 building will be in the space that is next to the Performing Arts Center and the 400 building or the North Gym. So there's an area that was cleared uh, with our last bond measure to uh, create an additional classroom space there. And so the 200 building will be a two-story building, 24,000 square feet. It will incorporate 11 general use classrooms, which will be flexible spaces that can serve between 55 and 100 students. Those classroom spaces will replace the classrooms that are currently in the 22 hundred buildings. The 2200 buildings are portable buildings, relocatable modular buildings. So those will go away to make space for one of the projects that we'll be discussing in a minute. And then another thing that's going into this building, the Health Occupation Simulation Center, which is currently up in Yontville at the Veterans Hospital, that will be moving here to campus and will be in the 200 building. Repairing and upgrading job training classrooms, the 800 building, the 800 building is next to the, between the gymnasium and the little theater. So the 800 building is a classroom building. We'll be upgrading that building, but we'll also be, as part of this, creating an additional nursing skills lab. We could accommodate more students in our health occupations programs if we had additional nursing skills lab space. We will also be converting in that building, that's where the Math Skills Center is located. The Math Skills Center will move to the new student center, the 1100 building. And one of the things, one of the themes that came out of our uh, meetings with campus groups was the need for collaboration space on campus. Ironically, where the Math Skills Center is currently located was originally collaboration space for students. So it was a space where students could gather, could work together, could uh, uh, study together. And so we'll convert that back to a collaboration space. And no, Ken, we're not putting a fountain back in there again, although I, I hear there was a fountain there uh, back in the day. And then we would upgrade the systems in that building, elevator controls, entrance doors, interior doors, flooring, things of that nature. And for all of these buildings, we're looking at upgrading classroom technology in all of these buildings. Again, the theme of repairing and upgrading job training classrooms, the 1,000 building that is behind the 800 building, that's where the Criminal Justice Training Center is on the first floor and faculty offices are on the second floor. And so generally upgrading systems in that building, but also constructing some additional exterior restroom space adjacent to the tennis courts. That's something that was contemplated previously. The uh, restrooms in that building are not adequate to serve the Criminal Justice Training Center, and so that would give us the opportunity to improve restroom facilities for that building. The machine tool and welding building, building 3100. Um, so Matt's pointing it out to us, building 3100. Building 3100, we would be looking to reconfigure the classroom space in that building, expand the lab space in that building to make it a better learning environment for our students. We would renovate the restrooms in that building. That building was constructed at a time when uh, nobody thought that women would ever do welding or machine tool. And so we don't have adequate restroom facilities in that building. And then finally, upgrading systems in that building as well. Um, the 1400 building, so we are sitting in the 1500 building. 
The 1,600 and 1,400 buildings are on the other side of the central campus walkway from where we are right now. We would reconfigure the classroom space and upgrade the systems in that facility. Modernizing and updating science labs. This is another new building, one of the, one of the four new buildings that are contemplated in this list. And that is a replacement for the current chemistry labs and physical sciences labs, so chemistry, physics, geology, geography. It's the 2200 building because it will go in the space that those portable or modular classrooms currently, where they currently sit, it will take the place of them. Gross square footage of 36,000 square feet, a two-story building, and it will include all of the lab spaces that you see listed there, as well as faculty offices, instructional assistant offices, and space for our maker lab and the equipment associated with the maker lab. The 100 building, now the 100 building is the Performing Arts Center. And the reason that the Performing Arts Center appears on this list is that there are certain systems in the Performing Arts Center that need to be upgraded. For example, you see the first, no, the first item there, replace wireless microphones to ensure compliance with current standards. Our wireless microphone system was absolutely compliant when it was installed when the building opened. The FCC has changed regulations about frequencies, and in about two years, the frequencies that we use for the wireless microphone system that we currently have will be in conflict with emergency communications, and so we need to make a change to upgrade that. We also have some lighting equipment in that building that we moved over from the old uh, existing 1200 building, the little theater, and those instruments need to be replaced and upgraded. We also are seeing increased use of the Paul Ash Lobby for events like the high school breakfast, which is April 19th, uh, as well as uh, some other events that take place on campus. And so we find that we are renting or bringing in audiovisual systems to accommodate that. So that's another upgrade that is listed for that building. The 400 building, which, which is the North Gym. The only thing that is contemplated here is that the walkway that leads to the 200 building and the elevator that serves the 200 building, exterior elevator, they were designed so that it would serve both a future 200 building and the existing 400 building. And so it's just tying the 200 building into that walkway. The 600 building, the gymnasium, we're looking at repurposing, perhaps not all, but some of the racquetball courts, renovating the locker rooms. They're very large. We could capture some additional space if we downsize them. Um, renovating the classrooms and the trainer room, constructing accessible restrooms on the pool deck. The only restrooms that serve the pool right now are in the 600 building. And then generally upgrading systems in that building. You'll also see that we have field improvements listed there. So installation of an all-weather track, raising the soccer field, replacing the irrigation systems, and repairing the baseball and softball fields. Moving on to the 1200 building, the Little Theater. The Little Theater is currently primarily used not as a performance space, but as a lecture and a presentation space. So um, uh, panel discussions, things of that nature take place in there. We use it for as a large format classroom space. And so convert that into a lecture or presentation space, which means that we recapture the backstage area to use for other purposes. We would also continue to have the food program or the food basket, I believe we, as we refer to it. That would still be in that space, but we'd renovate that space to make it better for them. And then look at upgrading systems in that building as well. The 1600 building right behind us here, again, reconfigure classroom space and upgrade systems. The 8 
1800 building. Now the 1800 building is where the chemistry and physical science labs are currently located. We, it gives us the opportunity to do a couple of things. First of all, we can move the MESA program to the first floor which means that the basement becomes a basement, again, uh, used as storage space, but also to create scenario space for the Criminal Justice Training Center and the emergency medical uh, uh, program as well. And then upgrade systems in that, uh, in that building. The 1300 building, the 1300 building right next to us here, the current Student Affairs building, with the creation of the student center that opens up space in that building so we can remodel and repurpose those spaces. One thing that we need to do is find space for SBDC, the CTE program and economic and workforce development. Did I catch them all? Um, those are currently located in a building that you will see come up in a minute. And so relocate them to the 1300 building and then relocate certain operations that are currently housed in this building, in the 1500 building, to free up some office space here. The 1500 building, the building that you are located in right now, remodel and repurpose spaces vacated by the move to the 1300 building, and the big thing that that would allow us to do is to consolidate IT help desk operations in this building, and again, get that out of the basement of this building. The 1700 building, the McCarthy Library, we have spaces in that building, DSPS and the placement and um, testing center, thank you, um, that are moving to the new student center. And so we would be able to repurpose those spaces, which would give us the opportunity to relocate offices from other buildings, perhaps some faculty offices that are currently housed in the 1000 building to give us some additional space there. The 3300 building, that is currently where Economic and Workforce Development, Career Technical Education, and SBDC are located. With their move out of that building, that becomes the place for campus police operations. Campus police and health services are currently in one of the 2200 buildings, those, those uh, modulars. Health Services moves to the new student center. Campus Police move to the 3300 building. We're almost at the end here. Um, the 3700 building, the Visual Arts Center, there was a phase two of the renovations to this building contemplated in earlier facilities master plans. That phase two would include upgrading systems and general improvements to that building. We have the 3,900 and 4,000 buildings. That's the digital art building, digital design and graphic technology, and the facilities operations. And so again, upgrade systems in those buildings. Child Development Center would get overall upgrades. Upper Valley Campus, we would replace the roof, upgrade landscaping, upgrade hospitality areas, create additional storage space, and remodel or repurpose room one, which is currently the science lab in that building to better meet the needs of uh, the, uh, pe the population that the Upper Valley Campus serves. South Valley Campus at American Canyon High School, attempt to create some additional office space, upgrade network and IT infrastructure, and as you heard earlier tonight, install signage in that, uh, in that area. The Mount Veter Farm at Bumpy Camp, reconfigure the house structure, create a retreat area and meeting space, construct restrooms, and improve infrastructure. And then finally, we have two slides of campus-wide projects, upgrade and improve the Greenbelt area, upgrade our overall IT infrastructure, upgrade our utility infrastructure for gas, water, sewer, storm water, and electricity, create a roadway connector to Gasser Drive, which would give us a walkway to, from Imola to the college, so Gasser Drive is the entrance to the movie theater and the area where the farm market is located, so behind the uh, South Napa Marketplace. 
upgrade and improve campus walkways. And so replace the trees, replace the lighting poles, the planter boxes, improve the grading, um, seismic and structural upgrades to the concrete trellis portals, portals that are on the campus walkway, and then create a covered walkway for the transit mall, the connector to the bus stop in the parking lot. And perhaps the most exciting of the campus-wide projects is a solar installation in our parking lots. And so there would be carports, both here at the main campus and UVC. It improves parking lot lighting, but it also generates 14.8 million in net savings over 25 years and offsets uh, our carbon footprint uh, significantly. And so that concludes the project list. Thank you. That, that was incredible. Thank you. And, and so maybe, um, yeah, can you go through the, no, or no, um, the, maybe some general questions. But I think our goal here was really to present that, as I started, this has been a very long series of very careful conversations with many constituencies. And you can kind of see how intricate it is. We are, we are not yet at the place where we are um, costing these out for you. We didn't want to bring those tonight because they're, they're not ready. But um, we will bring those in May for you. We're working with, and I don't know whether Matt or Bob, you want to use better language, um, our architects to, to develop the, the uh, construction cost estimates. So every, every item, every building, everything that you see will have estimates um, and we'll be able to better make a, an informed decision about the, about the next steps. At least you will have this tie, which was all the way from 2012-13 educational master plan, new facilities master plan, all the way through um, a great participatory governance process, out through the technology plan that you'll see next month as well, and then very specific detailed plans with very specific numbers. So um, I think that our goal is to be as precise as we possibly can while anticipating that changes in technology, changes as you've seen in legis the legislature gets something they want to do. Um, they rarely think it through um, in terms of what we need to do on the ground. But we're anticipating right now, as you can see in some of these success centers and lab spaces, the needs for what we consider to be very strong um, legislative initiatives and, and um, they appear in there. So with that, maybe Bob or Matt are open for questions? Or? If I could start first by congratulating both of you for putting all of this together and commending what great work uh, getting this information in front of the board has been. So thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, start with a couple of questions myself. And um, did I hear correctly, 30-story building? Three. No. <laughs> Three-story. OK, I didn't hear correctly. OK, I just wanted to clarify that one. <laughs> and then um, I just have one other question, and that is, um, when all of this is, you know, it, when this comes to fruition, is there a target number of how this would increase our FTE capacity? Is there a percentage or a, we could we could increase capacity by X percent? Sure. So at, at this particular moment, most of the upgrades and improvements and additional spaces that, that we're contemplating don't significantly increase the, the amount of classroom space on campus other than that it gives us the opportunity to reformat the way that we present classes, so some larger format classes, some smaller classes. It certainly expands the ability for the VWT program to serve more students through the increased space there. It also provides additional space to address some of the initiatives that um, uh, both Eric Shearer and Amanda Badgett talked about with the co-requisites and the need for additional wraparound services for uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, math and English classes. Thank you. Any other questions? Raphael. So th this is, seems kind of like a puzzle. 
have have you started prioritizing these cuz some things are moving from have to move from one building to another so what has to go first have you figured that out i i, I thought i could maybe try to go through there and figure that out sure. but maybe you've already done that well oscar wants the student center to be built first. But we actually haven't, to, to be serious, we haven't gotten to the point of sequencing. You know, what we're saying to people on campus is that if we could shut the campus down for three years, we could just build everything all at once. But you're absolutely right. We, we need to look at what has to happen first. So like, for example, the 200 building is where many of the classes that are currently located in the modulars will be offered. And so in order to remove the modulars, we probably need to uh, construct the 200 building first. So those are the kinds of conversations that we'll be having now that we've got the complete list, that sequencing of projects is the next step. Great, thank you. Trustee Martinson. I have um, two questions that are kind of connected. Um, so first of all, the student center that you said would be in the quad area, so you said that would be filled in, so that whole area would be a building? Yes. And so would the surrounding buildings be taken down, or they would somehow be combined with this new construction? So the surrounding, so the two surrounding buildings, there's the 1100 building, and then there's the 900 building, and the 900 building is kind of an L, so the bookstore is located at one end of the 900 building, and then what used to be the cafeteria, what is now the Student Activities Center, is at the other end. The only thing that would remain after construction of the 1100 building would be where the cafeteria used to be. So that piece of the 900 building would remain the rest of the 900 building where the bookstore is located and the 1100 building would go away. And that's the footprint. Those two buildings, including that quad area in between them, that's the footprint where the three-story student center would be constructed. So that's kind of builds me to my second question. So, because originally I was calculating like $100,000 or 100,000 new square feet of construction, but so a couple buildings will go away that you said there's modulars that would go away. So in the end, how many new square feet of construction would there be? So when you're talking about the, so for example, the 1100 building, the 1100 building will create um, additional square footage of, of office space and student services space. Some of the things that move into that area, so for example, the success centers, that frees up space in the 800 building, but it allows us to repurpose that space as collaboration space for students. Um, the uh, offices that are in other locations that will move into that building allow us to, uh, to better serve the needs of the campus by uh, giving more adequate office space to faculty members and uh, 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 other purposes on campus. So when we're talking about classroom square footage, what we're really talking about is the new 200 building but that replaces the modulars in the back. We're talking about renovating the 1800 building, but the 1800 building would give better space for uh, uh, the um, uh, CJT and EMS uh, of, uh, um, areas that they need, as well as the 200 building moving the simulation center down from Yontville. I'm just wondering a number, like how many, how much new square footage, I'm worried about, I'm concerned about maintenance, so I'm just wondering what would we, how much would we increase the square footage after all is said and done? So one of the things I would like to do is to be able to bring that back more detailed when we have the numbers that we're talking about more about the cost estimates. Uh, one of the things that I want to chime in here, that's a very real concern, obviously, for me and facility services, how do we maintain it afterwards? So that's something I'm very cognizant of. One of the things I do want to mention too, uh, related to the relative comparison of square footage. For many years we talked about renovating the 1800 building uh, and modernizing those labs. But with all of the requirements for accessibility and changes that have happened in the instruction delivery, it takes a lot more square footage 
than it used to for the same footprint uh, that we currently have in a lot of locations. So that's one of the things that it makes it a little more challenging to compare square footage for square footage because of those changes. There's also a lot of instructional delivery methods, uh, flexibility of group space and things that ends up taking a little bit more square footage. So I'm, I'm hopeful that when we come back, we will be able to further define comparisons for offices, as Bob mentioned, the collaborative space, uh, conference room, meeting spaces, all those kinds of things. We'll be able to break that down so you can see that a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Do you have a question, Trustee Baker? I'm not quite sure how to ask this, but um, there were a couple areas that just kind of popped out for me, and that was the viticulture and winery tr uh, technology area, which you mentioned that the foundation is working to raise money for, and then also um, further down the list there, um, in the uh, sport fields, there was the uh, baseball, softball, softball, which I believe our contract with the Silverados, they, they're doing some work on that as well. I'm just wondering how do those, those types of um, additional funds that are coming, how do they factor into the bottom line here? And are, are there other areas where that might be the case? So certainly there are projects on this list that could qualify for matching state funds. So renovations of existing buildings could qualify for that. We have to match those funds, but they could qualify for matching funds. The Silverados are making some improvements as part of our agreement with them to the baseball field. But the biggest issue that we have with the baseball fields is what happens when we have heavy rain. And that's something that we will need to address going forward. Um, and so while the Silverados are helping us with maintenance and upgrades to that from a, from a uh, spectator perspective, there are some things that we'll, we'll need to address as well. I just have one last question, if nobody else does. I have a question. Hang on. <clears throat> Michael. I, at this very early stage of the uh, needs assessment, you know, I've heard 30 stories, but it corrected to three. But, but some of these other buildings, is, is that the, the uh, architect's advice, keeping with the, the profile of the campus, that we don't go vertical? Or what, what's driving the, or what's preventing us from going up since we We've gone pretty high on the PAC at the other sure. end of campus. Actually, of the four new buildings that are contemplated, only one is a single story building, and that's the uh, additional square footage for the VWT program. Both the 200 building and the 2200 building will be two story buildings, and the student center will be a three story building. So we are going up with uh, the new projects. Thank you. Good. No, I think Russ. I think I uh, I heard the answer, but I'll ask the question anyway. There is there a time frame from completing this and? Well, so it would so from a from from a potential bond measure perspective, you know, we'd be looking at issuing bonds uh, potentially over a five to ten year. Period. So when we look at sequencing, as I said, if we could shut the whole operation down, we could get it all done in three years. But when we look at building this building first and then moving what's in this building to the new building and constructing another new building, you know, realistically, Matt, would you say we're, we're probably looking at an eight-year? Yes. Okay. And still no priorities as to what? That should go up. That's first. correct. That's correct. Our 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 first um, uh, the most important thing was to make sure we had captured everything, and so next would be that uh, pricing and prioritization. Okay, so I guess although everything has been factored in, the cost of construction, future rises, and those it, types it, of. Right, and that's what that's what we work with the architects on. So if this and and to, it, to that regard, we do need to um, look at 
some degree of sequencing so that the architects can realistically um, project what the cost of construction will be. You know, if we started construction today, it would cost a certain amount of money, but if it's a project that doesn't start five years from now, then they have to factor that in. Thank you. Trustee Harverson. I had a question about the roadway connector to Gasser Drive. What is that literally a road, or would it be like a, what's the idea? Is it a walkway, or? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, a couple things there. One is, as part of this roadway concept, is uh, jointly shared with the city of Napa as they're working on their Kennedy Park master planning. So on the Kennedy Park master planning for the city of Napa, they show a dotted line indicating a roadway that direction. So it, there's a lot of advantages for the college, both from pedestrian tra traffic in bicycle as well as vehicle traffic. Uh, many, many colleges have some type of a circular uh, a approach around the campus and they have uh, multiple ways in and out. One of the things uh, with Streblo uh, and the activity at Kennedy Park, that becomes a pinch point for activities down, on, down in that area in the park and along the river. There's no other way to get out of there other than Streblo Drive. So that's one of the things and that's why we have it in there. We see it as potential uh, uh, benefit for the college, for our students and, and staff to be able to get to the campus and to get off of campus, but it also ties into future opportunities with the city of Napa. Just a follow up on that question. So that would probably be a joint, a shared cost too with the city, right? If we were to do a road connecting, say, Streblo to Gasser, that would be a shared expense, right? It wouldn't. Certainly. That, that, that would be the goal because, as I said, they're showing it in their facilities, uh, their park master plan, and we've had conversations with them as we move forward, but with no level of specificity. Okay, Martin Sinabaldini. Um, so I'm wondering about the construction on the American Canyon High School campus. Um, so are they on board with that, the American Canyon High School and the school district? Are they on board with us doing construction with our bond money on their campus? Um, yes. I mean, the short answer is yes. We've met with the, the superintendent and the associate superintendent and the principal. Um, Oscar and I toured down there, and, and um, it's, a, it's a good start. And also those improvements are really classroom upgrades to kind of just work on that. We also anticipate with some of these, with our dual enrollment and some of the changes, um, that we may need additional office space, counseling space, if you will, to help students there. Um, we've, we're also in discussions um, at, a, at a high level, I'd say right now, and it hasn't gone to their board yet, but to um, advance the notion of, you know, credit, um, part of their requirement would be the credit, like New Tech, that has a 12-unit credit, so they're examining that option as well. And um, it sure makes sense down there for them. And the same thing, would that be a shared cost or we would pick up that cost? That would be our cost because we, we own that, um, those three classrooms and, and the office space. Okay, thank you. Michael. This goes back to accessibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, gas or drive. It would seem to, th uh, I would think that that would increase or decrease emergency response uh, from uh, fire and from on gas or as well as uh, police and other support. Um, uh, it, it makes sense in that regard. When we're talking about these new facilities, particularly up by the Performing Arts Center and, and the Student Center, uh, we talked about or you presented some ideas on, on solar over the parking lot. Is there any thought based on uh, um, enrollment projections that will need additional parking? And does that play into this uh, um, potential bond as well? Uh, we, we certainly have the expectation that we will increase parking wherever we can. That's one of our challenges, uh, as we know, that's one of the things. Uh, the goal through the solar installation in the parking lot is not to lose any parking through that process. Uh, so uh, we're hopeful, and I say this as a long-term uh, person that's talked about this a lot of times, that we're hoping with some additional uh, safety for bicycling 
and for pedestrians that we're going to better able to use some of the other transit options. Same thing with the covered walkway for the, for the bus shelter. We have the potential of getting a lot more people here other ways that alleviates our, our parking issues, so. Thank you. Great, I have one more question and then we have a public comment. Um, so what flexibility are we building in for new programs and any growth? I mean, I know that our CTE programs, we're looking at, you know, so many possibilities down the road. What, what kind of flexibility would be in there for that kind of growth? Well, it's a, it's a, a, that's a, it's a complex question, but it starts back with the educational master plan and start in looking at the region's needs, educational needs. So, so on the workforce side, if you're talking there, we don't know yet what we don't know. So there may be an emerging industry that um, we've had conversations, you and I have and, and other folks, American Canyon is um, an interesting um, template and they're trying to attract many, from, all from manufacturing to many other things. So it may be something that we would address. Um, I think that one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with all of these buildings is a certain amount of flexibility. Larger format, different kinds of, not these kinds of chairs, which were, this was what it looked like in the 60s, um, you know, but um, more project-based, rooms, um, success-oriented rooms, rooms that would be um, able to be used by many disciplines um, and that um, in, at some point could be integrated across disciplines. So that answer is yes, we want to make them flexible. Thank you. And mm -hmm. then we have one public comment. Tom Orlando. Thank you. Um, it looks like a very comprehensive wish list for what the college needs. and looks like no stones were under... Yeah, you know, no stones, all stones were covered up, whatever. But in any event, um, we heard earlier this evening that the enrollment essentially over last year was flat. Is that correct? What, what would the enrollment be like over the last five years? Is it trending upwards or downwards? Do you have an idea? I don't, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Eric, yeah. Sure. If you want. Yeah, I just needed to make sure I could respond in public comment. Um, uh, we're looking at a, at a slight decrease. I think that um, what we're at right now is maybe a 2% uh, decrease over the last okay. five years. Yeah. You know, the, you have to look down the pipeline as you're assessing your needs. And the Napa Valley Unified School District is in budgetary problems because enrollment is declining. That's because people can't afford to live in Napa County. Young families are moving out. So it's important to take into consideration the demographics of the county. What's in the pipeline? Who's in the elementary and high, high schools? And what that number is going to be if you can serve them properly. So I just want to caution you not to overextend yourself with facilities when you have an, a declining enrollment coming forward. And please take this into consideration in your planning. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more comment. Chris Malin. So I don't think all stones were turned up because I don't think that the college is considering uh, the fact that sea rise is going to affect the college. And um, part of the campus is going to be underwater. And who knows exactly when that's going to happen. We know that it's coming much, much faster than predicted and in fact the voters of all the bay area counties passed measure a in 2016 and i just saw in the napa register the list of projects now measure a in case you didn't know uh, we're taxing ourselves um, to prepare the bay area counties for sea rise so it's here, it's happening, um, and it seems to me that this board should be l looking at inundation on the campus because you may have to retreat some buildings. And you don't want to build where the water's going to be because that's going to be a waste of money. And so you might have to reconfigure the campus 
and inundation is huge. The Bay Area counties are taking this seriously and Napa needs to take it seriously too. And the college is right on the river. And about five years ago, we paced out um, the estimated rise in the Napa River and it was above the tennis courts where the water would end up. So anyway, check out the Napa Register. They have a list of projects that are being funded by Measure A. Napa qualifies for funding. So you could be putting your projects in and getting the money to look at what kind of planning you need to do. Uh, and the money's there. We're paying for it. You're in harm's way. It behooves you to do this kind of planning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other public comment on this item, we will move to 13.3, I believe. Oh, did I miss? Oh, sorry. 13.2. I did not mean to miss that. I promise. <laughs> I felt that look. Um, okay. This item is uh, placed on the agenda to acknowledge the attached 2018-19 initial proposal for negotiations from Napa Valley College Faculty Association, CCA, CTA, NEA, to the Napa Valley Community College District. Copies are posted in the administration building and are available in the Office of Human Resources. Do we have a motion to approve? Oh, this is, I'm sorry, information item. Information. Do we, um, are we getting a presentation on this or is there anything? I don't think Action. so. I think this is just sunshine and. and yeah. sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then 13.3, technology plan. He didn't get to sit long. <laughs> He's back up. So we're bringing this to you tonight as an information item. Uh, we will be, just to give you uh, uh, information about how we got to where we are today. Thank you. Um, and what our next steps are. So first of all, and we've talked about the technology plan before, but we started developing a draft of the plan in fall of 2016. The draft was in progress at the end of the spring 2017 semester. Uh, it, in the fall semester of this year, uh, committee membership changed and the uh, district chair of the co-chair of the technology committee is our new uh, director of institutional technology, Eric Halk. We also had some new faculty members join the committee. And so those new committee members continued the process in the fall of 2017. A revised draft was sent to the campus community for feedback in December of 2017. And the plan itself is a very high level overview of, and we'll see this in a minute just when we look at the, uh, at the topics that are discussed in the plan, but it's a very high level um, overview of technology and the uh, actual uh, um, specificity of what's going to happen is included in appendices to the plan. And the idea is that those appendices would be living documents that would be updated on a regular basis. But the feedback that we got uh, focused on the need for more specificity to be included. So the plan was in place, but those appendices were missing. And so the feedback was we really need to see some, if not all, but a majority of those appendices so that we can really weigh in on the plan itself. So the Tech Committee has been working on those appendices, worked on them in February and March. And it says work was completed this week. There are still some appendices that are still in process, but a majority of the appendices 
were completed at a meeting uh, that took place on Monday of this week. Now the Planning and Budget Committee saw a presentation on the plan and endorsed the overall plan with the understanding that the appendices would be added. They approved it on February, or I should say endorsed it, didn't approve it, but endorsed it in uh, February of, yeah. Endorsed it in February. The Tech Committee will be distributing those completed appendices this week. Campus constituent groups will review in April, early May, and then the goal is that that final draft will come back to you in May, and the co-chairs of the Technology Committee, Eric Halk and Joshua Hansen, will be here to present the plan. The four key components of the plan are standardization and technology currency, operational and workflow efficiencies, infrastructure and access improvement, and safety and security. And those are the high level um, key components. But then the appendices, and there are a number of them, is where the actual activities will be listed or are listed. And so what are the strategic technology initiatives? How are we going to implement them? a report on completed initiatives. And when we talk about strategic technology initiatives, we're talking about things like improvements to our um, enterprise resource planning system, things like the student planning module, which is currently being tested by a, a core group of students. So things of that nature. A glossary of technology terms, the institutional technology department organizational chart, technology governance and unit plans, an inventory of our technology. And we tend to think of technology as just being computers, but there's a lot more to technology than that. Our network infrastructure, our printers, and specialized equipment. You know, there is computerized equipment that's used in machine tool and welding. There are computerized mannequins that are used in the simulation center. And so when we talk about technology, it's really more than just computers. Our policies, we talked about this at the pre-board workshop, accessibility policies, a computer use policy, and probably most important, a, the technology refresh policies. So how long are computers in service and when will they be replaced? And how long is any technology equipment in service? Certain procedures, computer and network use, how we give people access and create accounts for them, um, account deactivation, what are the steps for technology procurement, the technology project initiation, if you want to embark on a technology project, how do you do that, and then the procedures for going through the technology refresh process. Security and disaster recovery plan, that's a very key appendix to the, um, uh, to the technology plan, how do we recover from a, uh, uh, any kind of interruption in service, an earthquake, a fire, um, a, the failure of servers, things of that nature. And then finally, service level agreements, so, or SLAs, and so when we look at Audiovisual, uh, if, if you put in a request for audiovisual service or for a assistance from the help desk, what should you expect? What is the response time that you should e expect? Our standards, our accessibility standards, classroom and office technology standards. So if we are installing equipment in a classroom, what will that standard be? Um, and how can we deviate from that standard? What is the process for doing that? Um, software standards, website standler, standards, wireless hardware standards, and then finally, a place to capture technology surveys. So those are all of the elements that you will be seeing when the technology plan is presented to you at next month's board meeting. Great. Thank you, Bob. Are there any questions for Bob at this time? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to 13.4, and then after this item, we will take a short break. 
Interesting. Um, and this item on the agenda is to allow the first reading of new revised or to be repealed policies. The policies below were replaced by BP 7340 leaves, which was approved in 2014 and should have been repealed at the same time. The, new, the newer board policy is attached for reference. Any comments or questions on any of these uh, policies? All right. Okay. Well, we will take a 10 minute break and come back at 8.05. Set it for four hours at four o'clock, and so it was like I didn't notice that it. I'm not sure if you gave me but it's okay because we're not using it because for some reason they can't. Yeah, it goes well fast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't remind you. Like, not to. It's not my, it's not my eyeball. Right in front of me. Thank you.
I would think so. I just swear I nodded off. What was I gonna? Oh, any good fishing? Oh, I've just I, I took this morning trying to old buddies that we we went out. It was okay. It was a machine trip. Out the boat out. You only really light uh, But everything else is fly fishing. And so this morning, we've been having a little trouble. I think we set up our next trip. <laughs> worked out for our next year, uh, uh, towards the end of March up in uh, the Sierras. God, that's a fun trip. My uncle's, well, I go to Alaska, but that's all ocean. Do you have some stream river fishing? Well, I think I might try and do... I know, I love that my uncle's done some of those. Fish planes? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of on my bucket list. I think that would be a fun trip. Really? That's all. I need one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, is that where this is? <laughs> Seems with my 3800 bucks to not too bad. But he ain't go up to the way. Yeah. As long as you're going to like. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. It's finding, you know. <laughs> A lot of them aren't into fishing. But my uncle would go, but that's two people. I would love to do something like that. Maybe Ron? Can we fly a rod? I don't know. Are you a fly fisherman? Uh, right. I'm a great fisherman. <laughs> What's the clock that goes like this? Right. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it since I was in high school. Oh, yeah. oh so you're better you guys modern. Can you roll, roll can, cast can, and everything? Roll cast is where you start when you don't know how to... I know, but when you can get into like a little... I can get that. <laughs> okay. It's a light touch, right? It depends on the rod. I mean... All the trout streams, I've switched to a three rod, real light, you know. 
Can we fish the floating strings? line or sinking line? Floating. Uh, I like to drive fly fish mostly. So. <laughs> it's something that attracts people. What's the school out by Sonoma? You cast the fish. Oh, really? It's a Leland fly fishing. Uh, store and they've got the man-made creeks and ponds. But they don't let you cast so it. They would teach you out there. They teach you. They, 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 they won't let you. But you can't. Oh, you're yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm just so glad I don't have to try. I remember when Ord. Oh, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, guys, you, can uh -huh. you can get at uh, Sweeney's. They've got guys. Oh. So I always have to sort of run out. So, Carolee, I'm just thinking, is there like, I'm just thinking, okay, easiest way to record votes. Ron said he's recording first and second. I'll be doing that too. I'll just write unanimous if you name this. I'm just, you know, instead of using this, it's just shut it shut itself off actually because I set it to four hours and then a minute ago it went pew. So okay, so we're not even using fish and the cast. Yeah. I could, but is there any point if they can't see it? stock? He caught a seagull. And it's like, where did it? Can somebody flick the lights like it's, a, you know? <laughs> we're, we're, we're at the theater. I can't see it. Okay, I'll just do it. I mean, I'm just not sure what's faster. All right, let's get let's get started. Where is uh, Trusty Baldini? Trusty Martinson. All right. We're back in session. Consent calendar, approval of consent calendar 14.1. Uh, do we have any items to pull on the consent calendar? I had a question yes. about 14.3. Do you need to pull it or just a question? I think it may just be a question, so it may okay. not be so however okay. you want to handle it. Don't we need to pull it so that we can ask a question and talk about it? I don't. I don't, uh, I don't think it would affect the outcome. It was just a, something I wanted to clarify. A clarifying question. Yeah. About. That's fine. To you, how yeah. You sure. I mean, Char and I are going to address it. I think. She just has a clarifying fourteen point three. Uh, shall I go ahead and answer, ask it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was in, in uh, regard with regard to the um, the number of interim positions that we have, and I just was curious, and maybe this is something to go on a future agenda. Um, you know, if we have a policy, or if it's ever, we've ever considered developing a policy that um, addresses how long someone is interim before a position really does need to go out for recruitment. It, it, um, you know. I understand there can sometimes be extenuating circumstances around a specific position, but we've got um, at least three big positions right now and, and some others I know that sometimes seem to go on interim for a long time. So I, the, the short answer, I can answer it very short. The, um, the state chancellor's office has um, definitive guidelines for administrative But Ron, staff. I think that that's probably not the question, the item. Direct, oh. I think that we I'm with like you. To either it. need to pull yeah, 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 that. Because yeah. I have some quick or, comments, too. I, or we need to either pull it or we need to make it a future agenda item. I'd like to pull so it. So which would you like to do, it sounds like Trustee uh, Baker? Trustee Martinson has some additional questions, so we might as well pull it. Okay. Okay. All right. So then approval of consent calendar with 14.3 pulled. Seeing no objections to that. Consent calendar is approved. And then how have we, would you, 
Where do you want to move, where are you moving that to? Or? I was just going to ask you, would you like to move that to the end or would you like to do that Why first? don't we go ahead and move on that right now? Go ahead and take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, so now, Trustee Baker, do you want to uh, ask your question and... Can you speak in the microphone? I didn't realize it wasn't on. Um, just mostly my question was, we got contract and regular faculty, and we've got three, four, three people in regular faculty, and then one under administrative confidential, and you were, say, you were just saying that, that the Chancellor's Office has guidelines for the, the one, correct? Yes, for administrative, um, and I'm not sure about confidential, but, but for administrative, I'm clear. Okay. Um, there's a two-year guideline, mm -hmm. and um, it used to be years ago, one year, and Maybe in 12, 2012, they extended it to um, a two-year interim cycle. Mm -hmm. So, and we hold that. We haven't gone over that. So, um, sometimes it might feel like that. For faculty, I think you're talking about another issue that maybe Eric or, or Charles can talk about. Well, can we stick with the administrators first before we move up? Do you have, I don't know if you have questions about faculty, do you? Go ahead. I, I guess, so that's the, the maximum that we can do that per the chancellor's office, but I'm wondering why we're choosing to do that. Why, when we know that there's a position that we need to fill, why we're not opening it up and hiring somebody on a permanent basis? Um, the, the short answer to that is we are. Um, so um, the, depending on circumstances, the hiring committees, the cycle, the, I, what I'd call the pool um, that's available, time of year. Um, so, so if we recognize, for example, an un, um, unanticipated retirement or step away at the college, you know, this time of year or before the break or out of the normal cycle, we usually go to an interim. So then you have to decide whether um, you know, an, an interim position would be um, satisfactory, exceptional, or just a placeholder kind of thing. And so we, we go through that process very deliberately each time. So our administrators who are in interims are in there because we needed their expertise. They're all scheduled for replacement, so they're on the cycle now to be um, hired. Not them, but the position will be go out for public. I guess what I was thinking of, like, kind of like what Trustee Baker said about maybe this is a policy issue is, like we have in our budgetary values, we have a statement on temporary workers that they should only be seasonal workers, that we shouldn't just be keeping people in that position. And I don't know if we have anything like that for these interim administrators or faculty, but I, I don't know. I, I don't, Charles can feel like we need something like that. So what you're referring to is what is actually an ed code and refers to individuals serving in short-term or seasonal positions um, that would fall generally in the classified. For administrators, um, under Ed Code, we can definitely have people backfill, we can have people serve as interims, but what you're specifically referring to is for classified. Yeah, no, I'm saying we, maybe we need something like that for these interim administrators so that even though we have the right to keep them interim for two years, that shouldn't be the default. That should be an exceptional situation that the priority is to open these positions up and hire people on a permanent basis. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, and then I noticed Lisa Gibbs doesn't have an end date on hers. All the other ones do. And since there's a maximum, I, I think that's a mistake. Hmm. I think she needs an end date. I'm, I don't have that at the tip of my tongue, but well, I'll check that to make sure. Can we, what, is, what would the end date be? Maybe we can approve it with that uh, amendment. I can't that answer that either. No, I, I'm hearing you say Charles and Eric. Has that gone forward or no? Do we know? Uh, so the so the end date that we're looking at with Lisa Gibbs' assignment um, would be dependent upon the filling of the permanent hire for the Dean of Arts and Humanities. And so the, the end date is upon the permanent hire for that position. But wouldn't there be a maximum per the Chancellor's Office? Yes, there's definitely a maximum. But she hasn't even reached 
a halfway point yet right. in this assignment. Right. So when we sent her to the board, it was for a duration of time. We're at that duration of time. Now we have to extend it. So the tricky thing about recruitments is, like Dr. Kraft said, there's timing issues. Then you have to think about the position. Then you have to think about the respect for faculty. And there's certain positions we definitely do not want to move on when they're not on, on schedule, right? In this particular one, we have uh, interim, and then we have an interim. And so once we complete the dean of ARA, complete that recruitment, that will allow us then to move on to the next one. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nice strategy, and we're always being mindful. Trust me, in regards to accreditation, our own standards, we do not want to be in a position to constantly have interims and do it for our longevity. But strategically, we do have plans in place, and we do have very detailed discussions on how to handle each interim. And when we're going to go post where, for how long, you know, to try to stimulate a diverse applicant pool. And when I say diverse, a diversity in skills and abilities and experience to bring back to the, the district. Okay. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Just do want to clarify um, something uh, Vice President Shear said. Um, okay, so uh, Ms. Gibbs doesn't have an end date because you're waiting until it's filled. How is that different from the other ones that do have end dates? So the individuals that do have an end date, we've already communicated that we are going to be recruiting. We do have a plan. So for example, in, in um, the interim for the Dean of RS, we have a plan in place. We know exactly when we're going to go out, and we know that by this time, we are committed to the district that this position will be filled. So we know where her end date is. However, it is a possibility that it can happen sooner or later, depending upon the results of the recruitment. So the results of this recruitment, the success for us to recruit for this position, will definitely have an impact on the interim for the other. Well, maybe um, perhaps the interest I, I have, and I think I'm hearing what Trustee Martin's saying, which is similar, it, maybe not putting a time cap on something, but maybe just really, sp and maybe it is already spelled out how, how it's done in terms of it, just to have it codified so that we don't have people in limbo not knowing. It's one thing when you have it with a, a conversation with an individual person, but when you've got some, is my microphone going in and out? It seems it's, like it's, it is. I keep hearing yeah. myself and then yeah. I don't. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so just so that, um, from the public perspective, they can see, you know, that there that we do have a plan because um, we obviously do. It's just it's not feeling like it's reflected in this document, so maybe it's somewhere else. Duly noted, and and definitely would take that into consideration. Um, but again, our goal is not to have interims long term. We do have a strategy to get our positions filled, and we're being mindful of that, especially as it falls under accreditation. So what is the interest? Uh, what are you I, I, hoping I'm, for? I would move approval of the document. I, okay. I just, my concerns have been noted, and I'm disappearing again. So. <laughs> All right. So we have motion to approve. Second. And a second by Rios. All in favor? Aye. 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 I abstain. And one abstention. All right. Motion be... Just a, on a point on 14.7, is, does that require a roll call vote, that for, uh, resolution? It, it does not. No. It does not. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, I, you know, Bob, I'm sorry. I may have answered too quick, but just because this is a little bit unusual. This is the resolution for the, for the refi of the bonds. Does that require? Oh. Is there any special piece there? That you know of, I, I do I, not. I do not. So our, our bond council advised that it could go on the consent calendar because mm -hmm. you've already approved yeah. moving forward the re with the, the refinancing. Yeah. We will need to indicate 
who voted yes, who voted no, and who abstained. But since the consent calendar was a unanimous approval, we've got that information for the resolution. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. Okay. So 14.3, whatever number we ended up making that, 14.8 or something, or... It is, that was 15.1 as an action, as, oh, as an okay. action item, okay. so I have renumbered. I see what you did. Got it. All right. Thank you. And that passes. So we will now move on to what was 15.1 is now 15.2. And um, so we're going to do this just a little bit differently because it's something that we would not normally do. It's a very rare item and um, hope to never need to do it. Um, but we're going to take public comment. I have public speakers. We're going to take public comment prior to board deliberation. So I will call public speakers up um, as soon as we're ready for that. This item is placed on the agenda at the direction of myself, the president of the board, and pertains to board governance matters. Staff makes no recommendations on such matters as they are solely within the purview of the board of trustees. Staff is advised that this action is recommended by a board ad hoc committee convened pursuant to BP 2715. The committee consists of trustee Mancuso, Baker, and Iverson. And I would ask a committee member to make the motion. I can do that. Um, so since I was on the committee, I'd like to make a, the motion to adopt the committee's recommendations as follows. Uh, first, in order to repair any damage that may have been done to board and Senate relations to the board adopt a resolution expressing its commitment to adhering to its role as prescribed by standard four of the accreditation standards and to adhering to the participatory governance processes of Napa Valley College and that this resolution come back next month. Secondly, that we direct President Kraft to prepare a memo to all staff informing them that they are not obligated to respond to inquiries from individual trustees unless the trustee is acting at the direction of the board and the employee has been directed to respond by his or her supervisor. The memo should also advise employees that they may decline to respond to unauthorized communications from trustees without fear of reprisal. And finally, that the board is in approving this motion communicates to Trustee Martinson its concern regarding the need to adhere fully to its code of ethics and that it is our expectation going forward that she will fully and constantly, consistently adhere to these standards as they are critical to the institutional health, vitality, and stability of Napa Valley College. I will second the motion. All right. Um, so before we go into uh, public comment, um, I just want to cover a couple of things. Item 15.1 has been put on the agenda in response to concerns made by the Academic Senate President Amanda Badgett. It is my duty as board president to act on serious concerns of a board member's behavior and respect the role of the Academic Senate. The agenda item is about process. Institutional health being highly transparent and accreditation it is not about content, subject matter, or a personal attack on Trustee Martinson. After attempts to resolve this matter with Trustee Martinson with no response, the Ethics Committee formed on March 22nd, reviewed all of the details, discussed the violation, and reluctantly determined this action be brought before the board. The committee was also made aware of Trustee Martinson's late response, but did not feel it was adequate or changed anything. It is the intent of the committee to bring this remedy and transparency to the board and collectively express its further commitment and respect to the college community and governance process. It is important to note that the Board of Trustees have, given, have been given many opportunities to learn what our role is and is not. So for me, it is clear that this violation did not occur because of a lack of knowledge. 
Now, before we proceed, there are a few process items that I need to cover. First, I want to be respectful of Trustee Martinson and give her the opportunity to speak to the board prior to deliberations, but want to make the board aware that I've been advised by district council that Trustee Martinson will need to recuse herself on this vote and will need to speak at the podium during public comment and not during board deliberations. There will also be a roll call vote. I would like to also ask that public comment stay on topic in the agenda item. So at this time, we will call for public comment and um, I will give Trustee Martinson the first opportunity to speak. I'd like the public to speak first. Actually, what I'd like you to do is first state what rule I broke exactly, where it's laid out in our policy and in accreditation, and what I did to break it, and why my response was not adequate. So I think you're bringing this forward, so the burden is on you to explain what rule I broke, how I broke it, where it's laid out in policy and accreditation, and why my response was not adequate, because I did respond to you. So I'd like to know why also why the response was not adequate. So that'll take place during uh, board deliberation, and we'll be happy to, to do that, to talk about that, to discuss that, because the committee was also involved, so the committee would also uh, have input on that. So uh, if we could go to public. You're supposed to present first, and where's the presentation? You haven't said anything. I did. Okay. Um, All right. And okay. in the agenda item, it clearly states the, um, I, I, you know, talked about board policy 2715. You're making an accusation, so you should lay out your case. For. What rule I broke, how I broke it, where it's laid out in policy and accreditation, and how my response was not appropriate. That's your case, and I haven't heard any of that. Okay, so now we're getting into deliberation, and that's not where we should be. So I'm going to move to pu public comment, and um, if Trustee Martinson wishes for public to speak first, uh, we will go ahead and do that, and, and I will start with uh, Gary Orton. Thank you. Madam Chair, Trustees, my name is Gary Orton. I live in Napa. I'm here to support Trustee Martinson. For the last three years, she has, with great determination, ably communicated community needs and concerns about this college. In this case, a concern about environmentally sound viticulture practices and a needed me mechanism for students to work on policy. Instead of trying to muzzle her, you should encourage her to continue the excellent constituent service she gives. She listens and looks for solutions. The contention that the email exchange supports a charge of misconduct is perversely misplaced. Your own code of ethics specifically requires trustees to communicate and promote the needs of the community to the college. In fact, the emails show exactly that. A dedicated representative communicating in a respectful, professional, and collegial way community concerns to improve the quality of the college. Not only would your attempt to silence Trustee Martinson violate your code, it would send the message that the college does not respect the consideration of different relevant perspectives, something you are required to ensure by accreditation standard 4A5. Dr. Anamosa in his emails stated several times that there does not appear to be a good mechanism for getting student input, especially with this board's, to use his words, self-imposed wall of silence. Ouch. But that's widely perceived as true. And actually, this board knows it has created a wall of silence. Uh, and included in that wall of silence would be the attempt by this board to insulate itself from the public by meeting in closed session beyond the limits of the Brown Act, for which you were warned by the district attorney that you stepped across that and you, you created a wall of silence even greater than you normally do. Accreditation standard 4A2, adopted in 2014, requires this board to establish a policy to consider student views and ideas 
conveyed not only by student organizations, but by individuals. Instead of blaming the messenger, this board should thank Trustee Martinson for calling the board's attention through Dr. Emer Anamosa to this lack of a viable mandated mechanism. Lastly, the utter lack of due process in this proceeding is jaw-dropping. Trustee Martinson is charged with violating, violating, violating an ethical standard that is as broad as space. What constitutes appropriate communications? Well-defined channels. Where, is, where are these terms even defined? You don't define them. So who decides what definition they get and when? After the fact? Such is the stuff of star chamber, of kangaroo courts. In any, in any case, and in, by any fair observation, Trustee Martinson's communications were respectful, professional, and relevant to the business of this board's policy function. In short, they were appropriate. In, ser in service to the community and the college, tear down that wall of silence tonight. It, this is not the right path to go down. This is wasted negative energy. After all the positive plans you heard tonight and discussed tonight, this proposal goes in the wrong direction. This is not positive. The community doesn't want this. And I can speak as somebody that has sat in your chair as an elected official of a city of 25,000. I was mayor. Putting this negative energy out there, the community does not like it. They will not respect you for it. They want to hear positive things. They want to see the positive plans you talked about. Please don't go down this path. It's going to get worse if you do. Next uh, speaker will be Carol Nagel. Good evening. My name is Dr. Carol Nagel. I'm a local psychologist, and I'm here also to speak on behalf of Trustee Martinson. Um, before I make my comments and questions that I have, which are similar to what she actually brought up, uh, I would like to read the um, ethics code as it was stated in the, um, the emails that was online. Uh, the ethics code referenced in this matter states, encouraging and safeguarding open access to the board while maintaining appropriate and well-defined college communication and decision-making channels. I agree with the gentleman that just spoke. Uh, if that's defined somewhere else, um, I'm not aware of it, but here it is extremely vague. Uh, I don't even know how you can use the words um, well-defined college communication and decision-making channels when it's that vague. To my understanding, Trustee Martinson's response to the board president on 3-25-18 seems to ensure both aspects of this ethics code um, that she was accused of violating. In that email, she agreed that she will not initiate conversations with faculty and staff about board issues. However, she also stated that if they reach out to her, she will communicate with them so as to understand their concerns. In that, she is also upholding the first part of the code, which is equally important. Again, I will recap. Encouraging and safeguarding open access to the board. Now, as I remember, when she was running for this position, that was her position that she was running on, is that she would be accessible and responsive to public concerns and needs and transparent. And I think her actions show that that is exactly what she was doing. She was responding to a student concern and having open, transparent communication. And then in terms of her response, even though her email addressed and acknowledged acceptance of both parts of this code, the board president said, in quotes, the ad hoc committee reviewed Amy's response and concluded that it did not adequately address the violation. 
I have the same question that she brought up. How does it not adequately address it? She addressed both parts, and um, I think that it's important if she did not adequately respond, what's the criteria for adequately addressing it then? It seems to me she did that. Thank you. Next speaker is Alex Schantz. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Schantz, uh, current student, former student trustee, former school board member on the ceiling of the school board for a couple years. Um, I think the first thing I just want to say, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear how much influence the Academic Senate apparently has <laughs> over the board's own um, issues. And I just hope that if like students had a, a similar problem with an individual trustee's leadership style, that you know the student representatives would have equally as much sway. I mean, same goes to the class fights in it. I just found that piece interesting. Um, the main thing I want to focus on, though, is the fact that Trustee Mancuso didn't even follow board policy 2716. And I'm going to go through this policy point by point briefly to make my case. Um, I'm going off script. I wrote it in, in the audience. So basically, Trustee Martinson is accused of violating the following provision of board ethic code. This has already been read. I'll just read it again encouraging and safeguarding open access to the board while maintaining appropriate and well-defined college communication and decision-making channels. Uh, BP 2715 says that the governing board will promptly address any violation by a board member or board members of the Code of Ethics in the following manner. Violations of the board's policy Code of Ethics will be addressed by the president of the board, will first discuss the violation with the trustee to reach a resolution. And let's pause here, because Trustee Mancuso did not discuss this issue with Chancey Martinson. Mancuso sent an email to Martinson, and in this email, it's worth pointing out, Mancuso did not ask for, for any delineated time frame from which she was expecting a response. And it's also worth pointing out, again, Martinson, in fact, did respond to this email. Mancuso did not attempt to call or meet with Martins in person to resolve this issue. So it just the idea that the first part of this board policy was was followed in spirit, like there was no discussion that took place prior to resolve this. So right off, right now, you've already violated this board policy. I apologize for getting so heated. This stuff makes me passionate. Um, I'm going to continue reading the board policy. If resolution is not achieved and further action is deemed necessary, the president of the board may appoint an ad hoc committee of less than a quorum of the board to examine the matter and recommend further courses of action to the board to take. In the background text for this item, it says that Trustee Mancuso emailed Trustee Martinson with her concerns and requested Trustee Martinson to respond. Trustee Mancuso did not receive a response within the requested time. Um, Again, Mancuso says that Martinson did not respond to her within a requested time, yet when I reviewed Mancuso's email, which again is included in the background documents, nowhere did she request Martinson to respond within a specific time frame. So that's disingenuous. And moreover, Martinson, in fact, did respond to Mancuso's email. The background text continues, Mancuso therefore convened an ad hoc committee consisting of herself, Trustee Baker, and Trustee Everson. She convened this ad hoc committee this is important, without giving Martinson advance notice. And this is just a basic violation of, of b basic best practices when we're thinking about ideas regarding due process. Again, Martinson did respond to Mancuso's email, um, and you know th this was addressed in the background text. The ad hoc committee reviewed, and the response um, concluded that it did, did not adequately address the violation. Um, yet, Mancuso and the background text here it does not, no one's provided any reason to explain why Martinson's email response didn't address the violation. Um, that's actually something really important that someone needs to s speak to. Um, in closing, um, BP 2715 again says, the ad hoc committee is charged with recommending further course of action uh, to the board, and yet this ad hoc committee it hasn't presented a, dra a, re a drafted resolution with specific text, uh, um, text to take action on. Um, and I'm just going to say, this looks like a witch hunt. Um, this looks like Mancuso being more concerned with silencing perceived political opponents 
at, at best, Mancuso sorely fumbled the implementation of this policy, and I'll end here. The root of this problem is rooted in encouraging open access to the board, and I think Dr. Paul Amorosa clearly articulates this problem in the email chain, um, which again, it's cited in the background documents. The fact that you are getting input from students indicates that they do not have or do not know of a better method to advance new ideas about the educational curriculum to advance the professional goals, and I'm just going to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Malin. I'm stunned. I can't believe you're doing something like this. I would hope that you would spend your valuable time and our valuable time working on important issues for the campus and the public, like getting a grant to study the inundation of sea rice. Do that. Don't go after Amy Martin, who did the right thing. She had a student that came up to her and was worried about the use of a fungicide on your vineyard. She addressed the issue in a, to me, appropriate way. I have not seen in anything you, I mean, you didn't tell us what she did wrong. You didn't tell us what the policy was. You didn't tell us her response, but instead, you decided to go into deliberation. Well, how about, we're all here. We want to hear it from you. And yet, you retreat and hide to do your ugly business. The public has a right to hear this. It's not right what you're doing. She did the right thing. She addressed a student who was concerned about a very a poison being sprayed on the campus, exposing student to fungicide drift. The children's um, daycare is right there. They walk in, they pick it up on their feet, they go in the classroom, they put their hands in their mouth, they get exposed. Napa has the highest cancer rates in the state. In the state. Look it up. Women, white women, have the highest cancer rates in the state of California. Children were first in the state last year. Highest rates in the state of California, Napa. Think about it. It was an opportunity for her. It was a teachable moment to work with a student, have an intelligent response, and look into it a little bit. And it looks to me like that was taken to the nth degree. You could have been collegial. You could have dealt with this with a scalpel instead of a hatchet. You didn't. You went way overboard. It's not right. You should know that. It's not right. Trustee Martinson. Sure. I don't have it. Okay. What is the date of the emails that you guys are speaking about? March 25th? Which email? The, e the email response between Amy and Paul Amoroso. So that's all on. Uh, that's all there with all of that information. So if I, you would go ahead and. I am the student. That inquired about the fungicide. Okay. On March eighth, 
I reached out to Ron Kraft. We had an email exchange Mar March 8th. That is over two weeks before, two and a half weeks before, she called Paul because we had questions about what was going on in the VWT program. I was a student here from semester, wait, 2012 and 2015. I left because of all the pesticide and herbicide problems. You must remember all my hemor hemorrhagic nosebleeds that I had on campus for months. How about Lisa Gibbs who got sick with cancer? How about Steve Krebs who left here shaking with Parkinson's because he sprayed himself to death for 30 years on his tractor? And you want to jump her? Because she's make, asking a very valid question that affects all of us in this room. I have proof, I have every email that was exchanged between myself and Amy and Ron and Michael Baldini and anybody else that was on our email trail. So if you want to get in, if you want to get in someone's face, get in my face. I am the reason for this. You should be addressing me for asking a really good question about the health of the students and you, all of you. How do you know that you're not going to get sick from the spray drift in that vineyard? How about those kids? You have to think like this. Everything is coming to a head in this universe right now. The world is changing. We can't continue to pollute and trash and run people over with chemicals and pesticides. And this is just basic common sense. And I'm really disappointed that you guys would go after Amy when the real issue is what's going on in that vineyard. I <clears throat> went to see Paul face to face a few months ago and he told me, he said, I am not interested in teaching organic and biodynamic practices. For the six months in the last semester of 2015, that's what we were talking about. We wanted organic and biodynamic practices here on campus. I arranged for Philippe Armagnier and Gabrielle Armagnier to come in here and teach these courses and nobody paid them the time of day. She is now teaching at Harvard. And I hooked everybody up to have the opportunity to teach these practices at this college and no non-toxic practices and nobody was interested. Yet you want to revert back to the UC Davis way, the way that hurt Steve Krebs and maybe Lisa Gibbs and maybe more of you? Uh-uh. That's a big mistake. So if you have anything to say tonight, you say it to me and you leave her out of it. Okay? That's all I have to say to all of you. Thank you. Amy? So I can't s sit at my podium and oh, speak. Sure. You told me I had to go sit at no, the... That's fine. If you okay. want to sit there and speak uh, during public comment, it's just a matter of distinguishing deliberation, period. Wait a minute, I'm confused. So what is this right now? This is public comment or still this is deliberation? Public comment, yes. So I'm public, public comment. comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so a former student brought a concern to me regarding the pesticides being used in the college vineyard and there not being enough emphasis on organic agriculture in the VWT program. And I emailed someone I know who teaches a viticulture class to ask about it. When he responded, he CC'd the professors in charge of the vineyard and they joined into the email conversation, unsolicited. Eventually, they CC'd others, including Chair Mancuso and the college president. I received a written warning from Chair Mancuso stating that I violated the ethics policy and requiring me to respond by the next day. So she did actually say, by the next day, she gave me 24 hours to respond saying that I should, must say that I no longer, would no longer communicate with college employees about college business. I didn't see the email right away, and when I saw it, I responded, it was five days later, saying, in line with the ethics policy, that I would not initiate conversations with college employees, but if they approach me with an issue, I will communicate with them to understand the concern. I assume my response was satisfactory because I didn't hear anything more about it until I saw the agenda for today's board meeting. The ethics policy is vague in that it refers to, quote, well-defined communication channels, unquote, that are not defined at all in the policy. The policy is also out of date because it references the 2012 accreditation standards, but the standards were updated in 2014 and say nothing about this issue. Nowhere does it say that we cannot speak to college employees. I feel that I'm being treated unfairly and that Chair Mancuso is violating the ethics policy herself by not having made a sincere effort to resolve the issue with me before bringing it to the whole board and by surprising me with the agenda item. 
believe we have in our shared values, not only things about treating each other with respect, but also about not sandbagging. If the college leadership treats board members in this way, I can only imagine how college employees and students who are more vulnerable are treated. In fact, we know that there is an issue with rules not being clear or even written at all, and as a result, people are being treated differently, as we heard about last meeting from the faculty union. And this is the tip of the iceberg, because there are many ARs that have not yet been developed by the president. And the rules are unclear. When the rules are unclear and not there at all, there's no opening for abuse. So this is a much bigger problem than what we're seeing right now. Employees and students on this campus are afraid, afraid to raise issues, and afraid to talk to trustees, and we can see why with what's happening tonight. And this will only reinforce that fear. So instead of all the recommendations from the committee, which seem heavy-handed, I think that a reasonable response would be to update the ethics policy defining, quote, appropriate communication channels and making sure that the language is in line with 2014 accreditation standards. And if we're going to state that we should first go to the president, we should also address what to do when the president is unresponsive, which he often is. I've had to often do public records requests to get information from the president. And so that's it. And I will have an amendment, a motion. If I can, do I, when do I do the amended motion? You won't be able to. Well, why not? And I would like to know where it says that I can't vote because that obviously stacks the vote against me as well. So we have the, the subcommittee, there are three, and then I can't vote. So I don't see how that's fair. Where does it say that as well? So everything's being made up here, I, basically. You know, it's not being made up. I can guarantee you it was with legal counsel all through the process. And actually, I'd like to so. speak to that as well, that I asked for all of the emails between you, Laura, and Ron, and we're actually entitled by government code, any, when one trustee receives written information, all trustees are entitled to it. It's the law. And so this idea that this whole board doesn't have access to those emails to know what was being conspired behind the scenes, it's wrong. OK. Um, OK, so I'd like to ask a couple more speakers. Um, if, if we could from the uh, faculty side, um, and uh, that would be Academic Senate President uh, Amanda Badgett and also uh, Dean Chabody. So I guess what I would like to do is just reiterate basically what I stated in the email, which was part of the supporting documents. And, and to clarify for um, Alex that actually the Academic Senate, by law, by Title V, does have a special relationship with the board. We can, in matters that are, in fact, spelled out in the 10 plus 1, we as a constituent group do have... But leadership style is different. I understand what you're speaking to. Well, okay. Thank you. So in any case, um, I simply, my job here is to be the voice of the faculty. And so that means that, and, and it has come up at various times, that if faculty have concerns and we as the Senate have concerns, I bring them here. When individual faculty members have concerns, then they bring them to individual trustees. Well, that now has broken down. And so just as I would make it an analogy, if uh, a colleague came to me and said, listen, I've got this issue with my, with my workload, and came to me as the Senate president, and I started working with them about their contract or their fulfillment of their contract, I'm now undermining my colleague over here. I have to keep to my side. The governance structure as it's set up is so that there are, there are clear means of communication. And I'm speaking now regarding faculty and the faculty voice. And if faculty have concerns, they should be, and that they come to individual trustees, they should be directed to me. I'm asking that, please. Um, and because it does undermine this process and this trust that I believe we ought to have in this room regarding the messages that come from faculty to the board. And I'll keep it at that for now. Thank you.
Hi, so I am Dinah Shabodi and I'm the Dean of Career Technical Education and Workforce Development and VWT is a program within my um, division. So first I want to clarify that Paul Anamosa is a first time, first semester faculty member at our college. He has not taught here before as he does indicate in one of his emails. So um, I would just think that um, one, for myself as dean, I read his emails too, and we need to use caution in the way we interpret what we believe someone might mean in their emails. Secondly, um, this um, email chain was disruptive to my faculty. I actually had faculty come to my office and say, if this person contacts me, I do not want to speak to them unless you're there and I will refer them to you. Um, the faculty in the program are the discipline experts. They get the information and the content and the knowledge um, from their advisory committee, which is made up of experts in the field. In addition to that, they participate and um, maintain currency um, in the research in the industry, both in viticulture and in enology. Um, we look to them. I myself as dean have no authority to tell them what they can and can't teach. Um, there are processes in place if they are have concerns that are faculty purview or if students have those, I send them to the appropriate channels. So if, if a faculty member um, has an issue or a concern that's part of um, the 10 plus one or primacy or is a union issue, I actually refer them to the presidents of those organizations because those are the organizations that speak for faculty on this campus by, regula by regulation and also by campus policies. Um, I just did that yesterday, actually. Um, it is essential that um, faculty um, processes are followed and um, that my faculty are not interrupted or, um, or hindered in the work that they do. And there are, there are um, processes that should be followed. And I have actually had this conversation myself. I was at a board retreat a couple years ago when I was the faculty association president. And we clarified that point at that meeting where I, I actually was the one that said that if someone comes to from the community or a student on campus comes to a board of trustees member and has an issue, a concern, a complaint, that, that the process to follow is to refer that person to the appropriate um, agency or, or not agency organization on campus and um, that the people that are um, responsible for speaking for faculty on this campus are the presidents of those respective groups Amanda Badgett and um, Christy Uemoto at this time um, but the faculty we have on this campus I would argue everywhere but in our VWT program are stellar they are tops in their field they they maintain currency in their research and they do address pertinent issues within their coursework. Thank you. OK, so now we will go to conversation deliberation with the board. But I want to clarify just a couple of things real quick. Um, it was stated that I did not give Trustee Martinson a timeline. I sent one email with no response. I sent a second email not the first email saying a day later, but the second email asking for a response the following day. Um, and so I, I did give an opportunity for a response and it's not something that can be done in a phone call because I had to really state uh, the entire but situation. within five days you had time to assemble a subcommittee and make a de declaration yeah, within yeah, five days? Please. Um, and then one last, and then one last item uh, is that we are all happy to hear trustees' ideas. We are happy for people to come to us with great ideas, but we want it to be transparent, and we want it to be through the correct channels, so that there is no one here that is not interested in hearing great ideas, ideas that are good for people's health and safety. We just need to respect uh, people's roles and people's time. And, uh, and one last thing is that uh, this is not a new conversation. This is a conversation we've had many, many times, and my fellow board presidents could um, also attest to that. 
So at this point, I will uh, turn it over to the rest of the board, if the committee has anything else to say, or if there are any questions from other board members. If no one else has anything to say, I would, no. Can we comment with what you've had to say or no? No. How do we respond to what you're saying? I've heard what, we've all heard what you've had to say, and we're taking it into consideration as we deliberate. We do not. This is now board deliberation time. There's no other way to communicate any more information or any other thing that could be pertinent to the situation. Not at the time that the board deliberates. Okay. Trustee Baker. I was just going to add that one of the reasons that um, Chair, Chairwoman Mancuso stated to me that she wanted me to be on this committee was because Trustee Martinson and I are friends and she didn't want there to be an appearance that you were being ganged up on and I hope I mean I know that that's how you feel right now and I'm sorry for that I in when we were discussing it in the committee I specifically asked multiple times has she had adequate time to respond and I, you know, I understand that and I and I also pointed out that the email address that was being used is not one that is one that I know that you frequently have difficulty with but I was assured that there had been other communications with you on that same email address within the same time period um, so it was quick, but it was also made very clear to me and to the other members of the committee that it was our responsibility to move quickly and that um, we needed, that this was about process. This wasn't about top the person. It was about making certain that we assured the academic senate and the faculty that we were taking their concerns seriously and that we were going to act uh, quickly and not drag this out. So that's all I have to add. Thank you. Does anyone uh, else? Uh, Kyle uh, Rosada, go ahead. When are, you, when are you gonna say what rule I broke and where it's written, where it's defined and where in accreditation? Rosada. When I became a trustee, and I attended a conference, in, uh, my first conference about a year ago, January 2017, and I went to the ethics um, portion of it. It was very clear to me that I was not to mendle with faculty and how they set up classes and programs, because that's why they're getting paid for. And you guys are the experts on who to hire, what to do, what's best for the students, uh, and so on and so forth. So if a student approaches me, I will either send them to Eric or whomever or address, it, address the issue with the appropriate person and not necessarily go directly to the English teacher or the math teacher or what have you. And I, I do understand that this is a very uh, organic growing or chemical farming. It's a real issue, as stated by my Ms. Malin, not only in the Napa Valley, but anywhere where agriculture exists. So, you know, I, I know my boundaries. I understand my boundaries because they were very, they were made very clear to me. So, you know, and then it's not on topic. It's about the process and how everything was used. That's what I have to say. Trustee Rios. Um, I do have a, a few comments. Um, first of all, I think there was a, a lot said that just kind of clouds the issue. I mean, one of my comments was what uh, uh, Trustee um, Segura just commented on, 
from the day that I became a trustee and attended some of our educational seminars in Sacramento, we've all been through those. It's been very clear that the board is supposed to stay out of curriculum, you know, instruction, and uh, all those things that are the purview of the faculty. Uh, so I think Trustee Martinson is aware of that. I don't think there's any question that she can talk to students and, and people that, that bring her issues um, and that those things should be brought to the board to see how they're dealt with, uh, but with policy and on a, on a broader scale. Uh, I think the issue about the, um, uh, the pesticides is, yes, a huge issue, but it's a little disingenuous for people to say that nobody cares about that, that the board doesn't care. Well, that's something that the faculty needs to, to address as to whether it should be taught or how and, and, and when. Um, the, obviously, the, the faculty from those emails, the faculty that was involved felt threatened. That's what I, I felt in reading those, those emails. So there is a concern uh, about that. Uh, as far as um, the recommendations, I think that you take the first two recommendations that the committee came up with, that applies to all of us. I think the, the faculty should know that. I have no problem with us adopting a resolution that tells them that. Uh, as far as the third one, I think Trustee Martinson obviously clearly hears the concerns at this point, whether she agrees, disagrees with whether the process was correct or, or, or whatever. I think she's heard the concerns. Um, I did take her um, response to, to indicate that she understood that and that she will not do that, you know, uh, contact the faculty directly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually for adopting uh, one and two. I don't really care. I think the, the purpose has been served with our discussion uh, here tonight and even uh, modifying the third recommendation uh, that that would apply in general to all of us that we need to adhere uh, to those policies and respect the um, structure of the governance um, with the college faculty and, and all the other constituencies. So that's it, thank you. I'll second that if that's a motion. I, I will make that a motion, yes. Okay. So that's an amendment. An amendment to the... To the motion. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And um, about the any seconds, that amendment to the motion. And that amendment is to say, instead of Trustee Martinson, the board, is that what you're saying? That's right, to make it generally apply to, to everyone. I think the, the faculty should know and we should all be reminded that this is the way we're supposed to uh, deal with um, these issues. Okay. And further discussion, I don't think I heard. So, M Michael, I, I do think this is an issue I'd like to hear from everybody on. It's uh, only in the, the 15 years I've, I've served the the college and the many years I've taken classes here, this is the, the first time that I, this is, this sort of item to my knowledge has come before the board. And as a student and as a trustee, I've had many conversations with uh, students, with faculty, with staff, and, and, and I've, I've always done my best to be respectful of, of uh, uh, what's taught in the class, and, and if anybody wants to look at my uh, my transcripts, they're not all A. So there's definitely been some some uh, learnings that I that I need and about certain uh, certain things. But uh, um, you know, I, I'm disappointed it's it's come to this. One of the the word that that triggers my emotions and and uh, makes me think hard is that word or the attempt to influence and and I 
I definitely don't believe or agree with that or condone that sort of behavior to influence a, a professor to work within a department to to bring about change. And we've talked about transparency. We've talked about uh, the, the need for the board to be more transparent, to, to have a better knowledge of what's going on, but that certainly is not the, the way to do it, uh, is, is to bring it forward. And, and I know of these advisory groups. In fact, I saw a list from 2007 um, at my house that I went through, and, and that would be nice to have it updated so we could actually see as uh, trustee members what the advisors that we're so blessed to have in supporting this college and also uh, uh, to provide uh, um, feedback and, and uh, um, as, as Paul says, to uh, uncover what's out there in the, the industry as far as best practices, and, and I, I have no doubt that our faculty is in all these years that I've sat on the board and, and way back when uh, previously that our faculty practices just that, best practices. Um, and I, I've seconded uh, Raphael's motion on, on... What is the motion? The motion was to uh, revise these recommendations, changing the third one to apply generally to the all board members. Finish. I, I guess I understand. Can, I just I'm trying to understand. <laughs> okay, I get how let, the first two. I don't get how the third one can be revised. Okay, can we please let? Uh, so I I support the 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 motion as as uh, amended as Raphael presented. Uh, I, I think it's something that we all need to state of how we support the faculty in this college. And, and uh, I think once I stood on my head to demonstrate that fact, and I'm willing to do it again. And thank you. Thank you. Trustee Iverson, you're the only one we haven't heard from yet. I, uh, I echo uh, Trustee Rios and Baldini. Um, it's not personal. It's not about the content, it's about our process as a board and our policies. And it's not, it's not a fun, it, I didn't want to have to do this. I didn't want to have to be a part of the committee either, but we have to respect our policies and procedures as a board. I never heard why my response wasn't satisfactory. Nobody, ex they said they would explain that and nobody explained I that. Can do, I can do that. So, um, and I just wanted to go through the you know, proper process to get to that point um, because it's, you know, certainly uh, your question to ask. Um, so when the committee got together and, and talked about the response, um, the issue with the response, and let me just pull it up here in front of me real quick. was that uh, it focused on initiating the conversation, and then the last piece uh, was if they reach out, I'll communicate with them. And, um, and, and again, it, it's like, like Dean Chaboti said in that meeting when we had that retreat back when, we want to be careful to not undermine the process. And in those emails where the conversation, and I understand that you're agreeing that you won't directly initiate those kind of conversations again. Um, but even if someone had come to you and started the conversation and engaging in that conversation and discussing um, you know, influencing curriculum with that person would still not be an okay thing. It would not, still would not be something, it would still be something that could jeopardize, and the whole issue here is really around protecting accreditation, and um, it, it is. And it's nobody, there. nobody is interested in doing this. Nobody. Nobody is happy about doing this, and, um, Marianne, it's nowhere but in this conversation has taken place time and time again, 
and we needed to make a point, especially after the email that was sent by um, the Senate president, we had to respond, okay? We had to respond. There was nothing else we could do there. So, do you want to, can I say one thing really quick? I just want to say that I just, all of us know people here at the college. I, Paula is somebody I knew before he taught a class here. I have his personal email. I reached out to him as somebody that I've talked to in the past. I know he told me he talks to Michael Baldini about the vineyard and about wine, uh, the winery operation. So we all know people here, and I'm sure we've all talked to people at the college about college issues, college business. You just didn't get caught on an email chain. I disagree Can with I that, but email policy? Um, there are board policies. There are board policies. So let's. So here's what I would like to do. We'd like to move forward with the vote. Um, I understand that there is an amendment to the motion, and that amendment is to say. Let me see if I'm reading this correctly. That the board adopt a motion. On the third, the third bullet point, or the third number C, letter C, that the board adopt a motion communicating to Trustee Martinson be changed to that the board adopt a motion communicating to the Board of Trustees its concerns regarding uh, any failure to adhere to its code of ethics and that it is the expectation of the board that they will immediately, fully, and consistently adhere to these standards as they are critical to the institutional health, vitality, and stability of Napa Valley College. Is that, Trustee Rios, what you had in mind? Well, let me, let me just actually kind of try to sketch this out, so let me okay. give it to you. It's, it's All right. my, my motion. So it would be to change the third recommendation to read that the board adopt a motion acknowledging its commitment to adhere to its code of ethics and that it will strive to fully and consistently adhere to these standards as they are critical to the institutional health, vitality, and stability of Napa Valley College. And the purpose of this is to communicate to the faculty mm -hmm. and the rest of the college that we as a whole are committed to that and we understand that role uh, to try to provide them some assurance that, that we will continue and try to maintain that relationship between them and us as a whole board. Thank you. That sounds, that sounds, uh, yeah. Motion so, and a second. So. so we have a motion and a second. We have a motion by Rios, a second by Baldini. And, um, and we need to take a roll call vote. So, um, so I will start with you, Trustee Rios. Aye. 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 Baldini? Aye. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Aye. <laughs> Michael. Aye. And I will say I and uh, just hope that uh, we never have to be here again and that we respect everybody um, and uh, board policies. Okay. We, um, so we'll, we'll get back. We, we captured, I believe, the language and we can certainly get it off the, the tape as well. So I believe you have adopted the motion to amend. So now you need yes, to adopt the entire we did. motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you have to vote on the regular motion. Okay. So it's going to be an, a roll call, and it'll be a nay, right? A nay on the on the original motion. Okay, trustee. So on the original motion, <coughs> trustee Rios. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, you've confused me here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If it passes, so, that's it. Yeah, Carolee is a, a bit of an expert on this, but we, yeah, I think you just voted the new. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Motion as amended. You, you approve the amending the motion, and now you vote on the amended motion. On the amended motion, right. Okay. So, so we, okay. So, so we, approved, we approved the amended motion. Now we need to vote on that motion. So I move to approve the motion as amended. There we go. Okay. Great. Second. 
All right. Rios, Baldini, and vote, please. Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 I think so. All right. Motion amended passes. Thank you. All right, 15.3 academic calendar. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Opposed? All right, motion passes. 15.4 faculty sabbatical request for 2018-2019. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven Any oh. abstentions? Aye. Opposed? No? Okay. Okay. Spring 2018 curriculum changes. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Sec Second. <laughs> Baker second, Baldini. Oh, okay. Segura second. Segura second. Baldini made the motion. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? All right. College career 15.6 college and career access pathways, partnership agreements with St. Helena Unified School District. So moved. Second, I have a comment. I just, this is, I know this is something we've been working on for a while, is mm -hmm. to better the relationship. So, good job. Do you have? We have it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Segura uh, made the motion and Iverson second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? <clears throat> motion passes. District fee schedule. Move approval. Second. Baldini made the motion. Rio second. I have a question or a comment. Yes. On uh, in our bond discussion, we discussed or brought up parking and so on and so forth. And the comment involved, uh, which I support alternative uh, ways to get to the college. Uh, and, I, and I note the parking fee is $2 daily. And I think it's been $2 for some time. The bus to do a round trip bus is $2.90. So we're actually encouraging people to drive rather than take the bus. Is that something that could be stepped up over time? So it's more expensive to park here than take a bicycle or public I, transportation? So one thing I know from talking to the city manager in American Canyon, that they identified that the bus running from American Canyon to the college um, was their most frequent ridership, was the most frequent ridership. And, um, and I know Jason Holly and was going to connect with Ron, maybe there are other, so and that could create, like they were talking about a special bus schedule and all of that, and maybe that could help achieve that incentive to take the bus. Or some sort of, it, we don't have our student trust here, so it'd be interesting yeah. to hear them weigh in, but it just seems that are you are you asking for a change or, or no? I'm just asking for some comment, discussion. Uh, some discussion on it, on the merits of possible change. Well, it's kind of so noted. It's a conversation yeah. that we're definitely having with you know transportation, with the pedestrian, the vine trail coming in. Um, I think one of the things that we talked about that that may not be as clear, but you know, is sidewalks from. Um, from the north end of the campus, if you will, that make it easier to walk. Um, we, uh, there has been no response from the um, public transportation for a broader student discount yet, mm -hmm. but um, that would also be an option. 
but it's it's so noted. I mean, it's not lost in the wind here. Yeah. And I had a question about um, the copy fees and the printing fees. Just curious because the at the library it's a dollar a page for colored prints, but printing fees for color are significantly less. So I just wonder why the discrepancy. Wow. If the I mean, if that's something that is. If it's a cost analysis, is it really cost a dollar to print a, a, pa a color piece of paper? So uh, first of all, the printing fees that you see here are from the print shop itself. So these would be large printing jobs that uh, we would be doing for um, either local not-for-profit organizations, but primarily for our own campus constituent groups. Uh, the copy charges at the library are a one-up, two-up uh, copy charge. And so they do tend to be more expensive individually. We are looking at a new mechanism for delivering copies in the library, and we should be able to reduce that charge moving forward. Yeah, I just would like to see it as a cost recovery and not as a money-making scheme. <laughs> scheme? <laughs> Any other discussion on that item? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? All right. Motion or uh, 15.7 passes. Ratify financial documents. Motion to approve? So move. Second. All right. Baldini Iverson? No, I vote no. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Aye. Six with um, one no. Martins in there. Okay. And one opposition, one opposed. Motion passes. Acceptance of initial proposal for negotiation from the Napa Valley College Association classified dated January 30th, 2018. Move to accept. Second. Rios made the motion. Segura second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Is that a 7 0? I didn't hear. Yes, I think so. Okay. 15 10. Approval of Napa Valley College Community College District initial proposal for negotiation with the Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals for the contract period beginning July 1, 2018. Motion, please. Move to approve. Second. This is, wait, which one are we on? 15.10. Uh, Napa Community College District initial proposal. That's okay. <laughs> I can Numbers understand changed. that. Martinson Baldini. Martinson Baldini. Got it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion 15.10 <clears throat> approved. Okay. Consideration of contract for video and audio recording and publishing of board meetings. So, uh, Napa Broadcasting President or whatever your title is, um, will give us a presentation. And um, as you know, the board approved $200 for the audio um, and the features that we're getting right this moment back in 2015. And so we're going to hear about our current features, I think, and some potential additions. Yes, we'll do a quick run through because I thought it would be a good idea to just quickly run through what it is that we're doing now and what it is that we're talking about doing with respect to the video. Um, I know it's late, so I will try and go through this as quickly as possible. The first part of it is what you know. At the, every meeting here right now, audio, we're recording the audio, we're streaming it live. And those are the things that we've been doing since, I think, June of 2015. Part of what the process is is that after we record it, the following day or the f couple of days later, the recording is edited, the uh, breaks are taken out, the heads and tails are taken out, 
and all the timings are listed so that they can then be transferred to the agenda for the purposes of, of the timing that you see when you go to, to look at it on the site. We then take the information and upload it to SoundCloud, which is the back end of Napa Broadcasting. We then post it to the Napa Broadcasting site. We then put in all the timings that you see that I mentioned before so that you can go to any particular spot at any particular time and get to whatever it is you want to listen to. We then add the meeting to the archives. We launch it live on the site, and that's what uh, people access. Most of you have been involved in, in one way or another in that process and in accessing it at various times. We generally do that. The goal is always after the Thursday meeting to have it live by the following Monday. That's generally been the goal. So let's talk a little bit about the video and what's involved in that. First thing is that because the video has to be captioned, it has to be closed captioned for the purposes of ADA, we've uh, found the best arrangement with a company called National Captioning Service, which is doing it literally as we're speaking now. I think I've talked a little bit about this here in the past. Um, we open up a phone line to them. They are listening to the entire meeting. Every hour or so, a new person takes over the captioning process. They generally call me and say, "So I'm so-and-so. I'm taking over the captioning right now. If you have any questions, here's my phone number. And then that goes until the next person calls in or until the meeting is over. We generally set that up and schedule it about four or five days before the Thursday meeting. The meeting is recorded here on video. It's single camera, what you're seeing now, and most of you have looked at this on video so you know, but what you're seeing now is, is what the video looks like. It's one camera focused on, on the dais. You don't see who's at the podium, and uh, you really can't see really who's talking unless you obviously know the voices. We then take the video, and this, this is where the process gets a little time consuming and a little bit complicated, because editing video is a lot more complicated than editing the audio. But we load it up onto a piece of software, and the first thing that happens is when it's recorded on that machine over there, it's recorded, the video is recorded on the thumb drive, it comes out as four or five pieces of video. They all have to be uploaded, they have to be merged together, the heads and tails have to be cut off, the breaks have to be cut out, and then again the timings have to be found. Once that's all done, it has to be converted from the format that it comes out of that machine to an MP4 format. It's time consuming only in terms of, because these are long meetings, in case you haven't noticed, they're really large files, so it can take sometimes two or three hours for it to do the conversion. Once that's done, the MP4 is uploaded to the Napa Valley College Board of Trustees YouTube channel. Most of you have seen this, or if you've gone to the YouTube channel, that's basically what it looks like. A um, little different on the back end, but that's the general idea. Then, once it's done, once it's uploaded onto YouTube, we then download the file with the closed captioning. It's something called an SRT file. We download that. That file is then uploaded onto YouTube, and we have to time it and sync it up, generally using the gavel at the beginning of the meeting as a way to sync up the beginning of the transcript, the beginning of the closed captioning with the video. That's all brought together. It's uploaded. The SRT file is uploaded onto YouTube. We double check the syncing and the caption, and then we, it goes live on YouTube. We then make sure that it all matches. I give uh, Catherine, I don't know why it says Kathleen, you've, you've changed your name. <laughs> we then give her also a copy of the transcript, the time transcript for closed caption, so that that's also a tool to use in putting together the minutes of the meeting. This is what it looks like when it comes out of there, the untimed version. Then once I give Catherine the timings, she uploads the timings onto board docs. It's merged with the video that's up there, and that's what many of you have seen. 
And I've had a number of questions about how many people are watching, how many people watch the video, how many people listen to the audio. Here's some quick numbers for the last five or six meetings. These are the number of people that have listened to the audio. These are not unique listeners. In fact, in some cases, if somebody's gone back four or five or six times, it'll list four or five or six times. These are not, <laughs> these are not unique listeners. These are just the number of times it's been accessed. This is the audio, and that's the video. And that's it. That's a quick look at the process and, and what's involved. I can tell you that I uh, did, did some re little research on this, and to basically do the same thing, the basics that we're doing here, just the audio, the video, and the purpose for the audio, we've talked a little bit about this before, but the purpose of the audio is to have, at this point, a backup to the video. The video can be very funky. It cannot record. It can drop out at times. A lot of things can happen, so it's always good to have the audio backup. So, and there's a number of people that have come to me and said, well, it's easier for me to access the audio. I can get to it easier doing it that way than going through the whole video. So the idea of having both seems like a good idea. The research that I've done with regard to what other people are doing and other costs, you know, at one point there was talk about Granicus doing it and, and their system. Um, a basic amount of work similar to what we're doing here. Um, I looked it up today, the Orange County Waste Management District. You know, they have a lot of money there. They can afford to do their meetings on video and audio and the whole thing. And Granicus does it, but it's a single camera. It's basically exactly the same thing we're doing here. And Granicus is charging them about seven, $8,000 a year to do that. So this, our deal is a bargain. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Trustee Baker. Um, I have a, a few questions about process, sure. and then I have a question about the dollar amount because I'm I'm a little confused. L let me ask the question about the dollar amount first, because um, so this is all for the two hundred a month. No, the two hundred a month is what we were doing for the audio only. Okay. We've added one hundred and fifty a month to include the video as well. So that makes it three fifty exactly. Okay, so this three fifty dollar amount right here, where it says fiscal impact, is a monthly charge. Correct. I, I think that needs to be corrected so that it's clearer what the annual charge is. Um, so I just curious. Um, I'm still. It's, it's one thing to have the audio backup. I'm still not clear on why it's on a separate website. I know that there's been multiple requests by at least myself and from Trustee Martinson that we get that onto the um, college's website. It's on Board Docs. It's, uh, but, it, but it, it's only It on links to. On it website. leads, it, it only, it, I, I, th I feel like it would be cleaner um, if it were separate, and I've made that case before, so I'd, st I'd still like to see that happen. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering, um, you, you kind of answered a couple of questions that I'd written, but the SRT file, is that generated by the closed caption? Yes, that is generated by the National Captioning Institute. Okay. You, you do Facebook Live and it auto-generates, you know that. Excuse way. me? You can use Facebook Live and it would auto-generate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, that's, that's pretty much, I think that pretty much answers my questions, but um, most of my questions had to do with process and you, and you kind of answered them as you were going. But I was just curious that you, you mentioned like the cost of Granicus for Orange County or wherever it was. Um, I'm just wondering what the com comparison cost would be for something that's a little more similar, say, for instance, the NVUSD or a small city like St. Helena that uses, uh, you know, what their what their costs are. And they have additional costs in addition to, like, I, my my knowledge is from St. Helena. They have the, the cost of um, a tech that's on site right. in addition to their contract with Granicus. And then there's staff time as well. So it's not it's kind of hard to come out with a very clean number, but I'm just wondering, you know, um, if I may, I'm not sure why you were tasked with doing that research instead of having a staff person do it. It seems like it's a little bit of a conflict of interest for someone who's coming in for a contract to be doing the research to, 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 to comparative research. So I would like to see the same information brought forward by a staff person. Questions? I have a couple. Um, 
Well, first of all, to compare this with Granicus, we have board docs, and the video is part of board docs, and it's free through board docs. And so uh, I don't understand why we're continuing to pay, and I brought this up before, $200 a month to have audio on a private site when we have video on our own site. And if somebody doesn't want to watch the video, they can just listen to the audio. Um, so it makes no sense to me. I've always questioned paying money using tax dollars to archive our board meetings on a private website that when that website goes away, all those board meetings are going to go away. They should be on our own site. Um, as far as an audio backup, the college used to do an audio backup. We used to do it ourselves. Um, before we had video, we had audio backup. Um, so that was something we always did. Honestly, any one of us could take our phone out and press start and audio record the meeting as a backup. And I don't think we should be anyway putting that, outsourcing that, because if that's the backup to our meetings, we need to be responsible for that ourselves. Um, and actually, a few board meetings, we. With Napa Broadcasting, we've lost the audio backup. We don't have audio backup. So I think that's something we need to do ourselves. So as far as video, um, I guess what I'm wondering is why, because before the executive assistant to the president and board did the video herself as part of her job. So I'm wondering why we decided, and she actually did it when it was much more labor intensive because we didn't have the the closed um, captioning that audio because the closed captioning that time stamps the minutes so now we have the closed captioning that time stamps the minutes so I'm wondering why is that not just part of the regular employee job like it was before well I can't answer that question but I but inside that's that for the question, president <laughs> the in, questions for the president well I, I understand because we're talking but, about employees but, but let me clarify yeah. a couple of things number one it, it's more labor intensive and more time intensive now with the closed captioning. So, so that, that needs to be made clear. The other part of it in terms of the audio, the audio has to live somewhere. You, you, it just can't be magically created. The audio has to be somewhere, whether it's going to be on the, on the Napa Valley College site or the Napa Broadcasting site. There has to be a back end to the audio. It has to live somewhere on a server in order to be anywhere. Well, I can tell you what happened in the past. It didn't live on the website. They just kept it. And if somebody wanted the audio, they requested it. Um, and if it's a backup, that's all we need. We need to have it available so that if something happens to the video, we have access to it. But otherwise, we have the video. It's free. It's part of Board Docs. It's, and it, so but the video, we don't need the extra service for the extra money. As far as the video, I guess what I'm asking is, do staff not have time to do the video because that I could get behind because it's helping with something we actually need. But I'm just wondering again, does staff not have time to do the video like they have in the past? Well, uh, we only did it for a, a bit. Um, and we had a temp do that. Cynthia was, you know, responsible for that. It was very um, time onerous for her. She spent sometimes four to six hours, you know, so were you really losing a, a full staff day? doing that so even with the with the switch to using the um the closed captioning because i understood that that now time stamps the minutes and that shortened the time period to do the videos don't have the answer to that i don't think it, they do no it doesn't yeah. time stamp the minutes at all yeah that, that what they do is just capture the the words that we're speaking while we're getting filmed mm -hmm. um then all of that process that we just kind of went through has to happen. Now, what it, is? I'm sorry, Ed, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, no, sorry. What 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 is our cost for board docs? Oh, gee, I don't know. I think it's. Uh, yeah, it may be. I'll just say, kind of like nine, maybe nine thousand. Uh, let me just real quickly clear up another misconception. I, I keep hearing the video is free with board docs. Right. But the video is not free. I mean, the video comes out of that machine as a file. It has to be edited. It has to be converted. It has to be put on YouTube. I mean, Board Docs is only running it from YouTube, and then it has to be merged with the closed captioning. So it's part it, ain't, of board, it ain't free. It's part of Board Docs, I guess I should say. Um, and it's my understanding, though, that the time stamping, which is really valuable, um, is not it's something that's labor intensive that somebody has to actually do mm -hmm. and that's not a part of board docs that is it's part of that's the video it was. it's part of our video meetings are time stamped that's because when but that's because some go ahead i'm sorry catherine 
I don't do that. I'm, I receive the actual times for each agenda item, and I just put them into board docs. But it would, it would, it takes hours to f to find that point in the video and figure out what time that was. Is and there, I don't do that. So I don't know if I broke channels, option? but I actually talked to Cynthia, and she said, with the new closed captioning, that now it timestamps the minutes. There's, no, it does not. No. Okay. Is there a function within board docs to do timestamping live? No. no. Board docs, you only load, you upload the video to YouTube and then uh, pro just pop that link. But board, 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 board docs, docs, the, board the docs. thing in board docs is essentially a player. You put in the time that each thing p takes place relative to the agenda and you, you've uploaded the YouTube video to it. And then it syncs the, what, the player syncs the two. So when you click on 15.3, it'll go to 15.3. But that's only because all that information has been put in. It doesn't do anything on its own. That Can I make a motion, or is it okay to do? Please make a motion. I'm gonna probably yes. end it. So call for the question. Okay. Well, oh, okay. No. Oh, I, I guess what, last thing I wanted. Well, I had two last things before you make your motion. Um, I, I'm in support of, you know, if we need help with the video, I'm in support of that. I, I guess my question is, why are we not opening up his regular contract and making it a part of his regular contract versus creating this separate MOU? Um, because honestly, part of the consideration in his regular contract is that there would be a daily one-hour college show, and that hasn't been happening. So it seems like this could be maybe. I don't think that's on our agenda, the regular contract. So well, I don't think we should be discussing. But it could be right now. I guess what I'm saying is rather than making it separate, it why couldn't it but be part of the regular? But it's not. It's not regular? on the agenda. Right. Well, that's going to be my so motion. So we can't <laughs> be discussing. It was, it was a one-hour show produced by the college. So anytime anybody wants to do one, we'd love to have it. Let me know. We'll air it immediately. All right. So we have a motion. Well, I, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we approve this contract for a three-month basis, and that during that three months, I would that I would really like to evaluate the total cost of this, because we've got more than just Jeff's time and Jeff's contract, and we've got the cost of board docs. We've got the the cost of other staff doing work, and, and it, it sounds like it's a lot of things that are starting to add up, and I think it would be worthwhile to at least look at other options, and I, and I don't know what our contract with board docs is, if it's if we've already signed like a year or what, when it might be up, but, you know, because Granicus does have time stamping, and it does have a lot of these things that, I mean, you still have to have a person and so that's not the part that I'm arguing. I'm just saying that you know there might be a more efficient and more economical way to do this, and I think it would be worth exploring. So could could I ask you to reconsider your motion? You can. Um, <laughs> this provides for 60-day notice cancellation. Fair if enough. we just adopt it as it is, that research can be done, and then we can come back and we can cancel if if we have a more efficient, more cost-effective solution. Okay. I I will amend my motion to approve as presented and then would like to direct staff to bring that, that research back. This is a process to discuss that motion. So, so a motion to approve as is 15.11 uh, and uh, that motion was made by Baker with a second by Iverson. So I'd like to, are we going to discuss it now? Oh, because I have, no, I have, a, first of all, a, just, a question. The contract we just discussed for we just discussed 15 it minutes. Quite a bit. Well, no, this is, we had our, our board workshop on contracts, and does this fall under personal services? This would not fall under personal services because this is a contract with a company, not a person. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to move to amend the motion. Um, that the president bring back a proposal for video help as part of the regular contract with Napa Broadcasting and that does not include the audio recording on his website. I, I don't see how that can be a part of this motion because this motion, I, I to amend the, the motion. item is about... I move to amend the motion. You're, but you're asking... So, so just let me get this okay. clear without 
frowning faces, yeah. okay? <laughs> okay, so we made a motion to approve this document. It was seconded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the motion that I hear you making or the amendment that I hear you making mm -hmm. sounds to me like a completely different subject, mm -hmm. okay? Because we've already established that there's a 60-day, you know, walk away from it. If then you want it to, during agenda items, say I'd like an agenda item that the pre college president brings to us, that kind of sounds like it makes more sense to me. But this, but this amendment doesn't seem to connect. I'm trying to take the audio out of it because I think it's a waste of money and we're all concerned about saving money. So I don't think we need that service. We have video, it's on our site. I don't think we need to be having audio on a separate site. So I'm trying to take the audio out of the proposal. That's Call what I'm trying question. to do. So I, can I, so I move to amend the motion to accept help on the video, but that it should be part of his regular, that we bring it back as part of his regular contract, and that it does not include audio. Is there a second to the amendment? There's no second to the amendment. So we go back to the original motion. All in favor of the original motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? No. One opposed? Motion passes. Uh, that's the amended motion has passed? No. no the original the, motion. Uh, the original motion. Okay, the amended motion did not get a second. Okay. Um, I'm, let, let, me, let me just say in closing, particularly to Trustee Baker, I, I'm delighted to work with anyone in terms of doing more research and figuring out how to move forward in any other way. Thank you, Jeff. All right, 15.12. Move approval. Second. Baldini, motion to approve, and Iverson, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? All righty. 16.1, standing committees, and I will just uh, want to mention something here that a while back we talked about minutes for standing committees. And, um, you know, all of us were kind of having this conversation. And so what um, Dr. Kraft and staff have done is to amend the AR, now called APs, to instead of saying notes, it says minutes. So, and I know in the legislative committee meeting, we did have minutes. Um, on the agenda and we can move forward with that. Okay, so on to reports. District, uh, that's. What, what happened to the future agenda items? It's coming up. We haven't got there yet. We haven't got there. Is there. it the end? Okay. It's next. No meeting. No meeting, okay. Thank you, Ms. Das. Uh, VWT. No Our, meeting, we're looking at dates in the uh, first part of May. Okay. Legislative Affairs Committee, we had a meeting, and let me tell you, it was awesome. We did have two meetings. Um, so we had a meeting, we discussed legislation that uh, we that was kind of a carryover from the prior committee. We got that sort of all cleaned up, um, and then Trustee Baker brought to the committee some great suggestions and uh, took a look at the matrix, the legislative matrix, and um, kind of pulled out some high priority topics that we're looking at. And so what we'll be bringing forward to the board, uh, we're also working on kind of a boilerplate support letter for legislation that we see that we think the board would be interested in supporting that's within our jurisdiction. And, um, and we're, Rocking and rolling. Cool. Audit and finance. Oh, sorry. I'm still writing my motion because let me show you this right. Um, let's see, we have our meeting coming up. Um, let's see. It is 
Thursday, April 26th at 4 p.m. here in the boardroom. Okay. And have we had a real property meeting, Mr. Baldini? No, we have not. We're still looking for it. And McPherson. McPherson? Well, the um, nominations have closed, and I am in possession of those nominations. I'm waiting to hear about when we're going to get together to select. Um, they said it would be next week, but nobody's said anything yet about when next week, and next week's getting here quickly. So, oh, next week. <laughs> okay. and, and I believe the event's in sometime in May. It's, coming it's the soon. same day as the trio event. So the same day is something else. Let me okay. say that. <laughs> Bunch of things happening on the event. Okay. That's uh, standing committees. Um, and we don't, I guess we don't have any ad hoc committees right now. Um, and future agenda items. Yes. So again, my items... Uh, well, thank you for putting the upper broadcasting item on the agenda, but my other two items uh, still have not been put on the agenda. I asked and actually made the edits to the board policies, and I asked to have the minutes policy come forward and the bids and contracts policy come forward. So I'm asking again. So doing a pre-board workshop on bids and contracts is not the same as bringing forward a policy suggestion uh, Apology change suggestion that I made in the in the actual policies. That's the item. So I would like that to come to the next board meeting, both of them, and putting the minutes into the AR. Same thing. I want it in our actual board policies. I'm actually quite concerned about putting everything into ARs, which don't have to be adopted by the board and can be changed at any time by the president. So if there's something that is within our jurisdiction and it's a policy statement, it needs to be in the actual board policy. So. I want those two to come forward, please. There might be some questions on some of that. Well, we can talk about it when it's on the agenda item. When it comes before the board with my suggested policy changes, we can talk about it. And as far as the bids and contracts one, I know President Kraft is saying that has to go through um, shared governance, but we need to direct him to put it through shared governance. And so I still want it to come forward so we can talk about it as a board and uh, decide if we want to direct him to do that. Okay. And I think that by um, having the workshop today, uh, it was, do you know what I'm saying? No, I don't. I, I, okay. I sent you the so board I policy. I haven't finished my sentence yet, and you're shaking your head no. This is what happened last time with something else that you put in the president's report. That's not the same as bringing my item okay, as so an agenda item. Okay, so you don't know item. what I was about to say, and that, you were shaking that, your head that, no. That took the what place. I was about to say is that I think that the... Um, workshop that we had today was very helpful in us understanding contracts and bids before we attempt to discuss policy. So regardless if we bring it forward or whatever, I, I think that that was a good first step for us to understand uh, moving forward what we need in board policy. I think as a question, let me ask Bob, I, I believe these two are under CCLC review as well, right? Correct? The chapter the, two? I mean, the, I'm sorry, the bids and contracts and the minutes, they're separate, but uh, um, is your bids and contracts policy out there going through some review? Yes, so that was, uh, uh, that um, CCLC analyst review, mm -hmm. the suggestions came back for the board policy and then the administrative procedures that relate, are related to that board policy on bids and contracts. So the, the, the larger piece here, which is fine, we can bring it in. The larger piece here is you're going to be seeing a stream of these tens and tens. So we've kind of um, geared these up um, this one will be a bit out of order, and, and, and we can certainly bring them in. Um, I, would, I just want to control the process only because it's complicated. We have a CCLC reviewing chapter by chapter, giving it to the vice presidents, then them work. Um, we as staff then take a look at them, 
then we have to adopt those, work some through shared governance processes through the Council of Presidents, others we do not. And so I want to just make sure that you're aware of that process that it's going. So this one sounds like it's already come back, got some suggestions. You probably would not incorporate at the time any one trustee's um, additions, but it, during first read, that would be the conversation that you would have. So I guess it would be up to the board. I, I would say that we're moving forward. I don't know, Catherine, do you have any, any timeline information at all? We're, we're really looking at the fall, I think, for most of these coming in. Well, that was the plan. It, it certainly depends on uh, the presence of Academic Senate and whether they will be here to conduct part of the right. review. Um, we could get started. I don't know in particular if this policy needs to go through Council of Presidents review. It's my understanding that we do all of them. The bids and contracts, not the minutes. The minutes one is within chapter two. Mm -hmm. So is that one also being reviewed by CCLC or, or by our analyst, or uh, can that one at least come forward? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, but that's an easier one to bring forward because it doesn't have to go through that other step, um, yeah. the Council of Presidents. Well, I, I would suggest that if we can, we bring that forward. I, I don't want to see us in the fall doing 20 policies yeah. all at once. So if we have some that we can bring forward before that that have gone through the process or don't need to go through the other side, that we do those as they are available instead of... I agree. I, I don't want to be here at, you know, at midnight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and kind of re you. related to all this. Maybe... Put minutes on? Okay, so no. we'll put minutes on. So and we'll then, bring the policy of minutes, and then... Um, with my change, I sent it to Marianne. It won't have your changes. It would, what it will have is your... You can, at that first, we, uh, we'll bring in the policy so you can take a look, as the board can take a look, and then we'll also have your suggested changes mm. as a separate piece so that people can side by side and talk about what you'd like to do. Kind of related to that, I'm wondering if we could get just an information discussion item about all the ARs that are not available online is like a timeline like we know when the yours are going to be ready by next September but there are many that are not online that haven't been developed and aren't online and a lot of them like and are legally required can we get like an update about where we are with all of those at some point can we start with where we've already discussed I mean bringing back the policies and yes it's kind of related they're all about policies and they are I guess what I'm hearing from the board is what the staff knows. So it, 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 at uh, the council presidents, we had a deeper conversation about this, what the process was, how the operations of this is gonna work through the system, the people that are involved. So if you'd like to know that level, I'm happy to bring it for a, for a, a meeting. Just a timeline for all of them. All of them. Well, just like when be a, they'll all, because we know when one group will be up, but one book, I'm not sure I could, well, I can, sure. I can give you a broad-based document, or it's more of an information item that would probably be lengthy, but I'm happy to do that. So it'd be an info item that we would bring on the policy review. Does that work? Yeah. Sure. Are we, well, I need more than, <laughs> I have one trustee suggesting, so I don't know. I mean, is, you, it, so is there any other input? I mean, everybody's kind of like the zombies at this point. Uh, I'll agree to anything at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Trustee Rios brought up a really good point. I think we should start with the policies. Let's a few of them, not all of them. And then we can look at the... ARs, if that's what you're... Well, we don't even develop those. The president does. I'm just kind of wondering when they will be up. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, trustee and board chair reports. Um, Mr. Baldini. I'm looking forward to having some birthday cake on Saturday, 75 years. Woo! I can't wait either. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> you will be there. <laughs> Trustee Baker. Uh, just, uh, again, reminding everyone, Family Festival at NVUSD on April 28th. So after you're done having fun here on Saturday, save it up for more fun in two weeks. 
I uh, wanted to thank uh, the staff for the updated communications about board docs. I really appreciate the way they've been coming out. It's like not just telling us there's been an update, but what it is. <laughs> so I don't have to figure it out. You're and welcome. Happy National Library Week. <laughs> oh. Trustee Mancuso. <laughs> so I just, I have to uh, get this board report out and I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. But I was asked by the uh, vice chancellor to join a group that met in Palo Alto about the 115th online college. And uh, so I participated in this, what was more of a how versus an if, which was kind of interesting. And um, it was a lot of about, I, design ideas, but after all said and done, so there were about 40 people in the room. I was the only trustee in all of California Community Colleges, which was kind of weird, but also kind of an honor. And, um, and what it really boiled down to was this, three things. Everybody felt it needed to be high touch, faculty involvement, and, um, it's so late. What was the third thing? High touch faculty involvement. Faculty accountability? No. Um, I don't remember now. I just said it to somebody. Um, so it was, but it, basically what it boiled down to is that there was hardly anybody in the room that thought, oh, it was community, it was integration into the current system. There was hardly anybody there who felt that a separate online community college was the answer. Um, they all really sort of said that it needed to be integrated with the current system. All the information, all the suggestions, ideas, and everything were great and definitely useful. They just didn't feel that that was the format uh, to be using them in. So, and there was a hearing actually today, and I'm, I'm understanding that legislators are not getting behind it. So that's my report. Trustee Iverson. To everybody on the airwaves, uh, just make sure you show up on Saturday. And these uh, are slick, and I just, are these going out as mailers, or? Are they gonna be available? Probably these available. These are then. from the, no, they're not going as mailers. They're independent um, handouts. Are they going? To, are they going to be available on Saturday for the they public are, or no? This or? is that, that foundation piece. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Uh, or. Trustee Secure. <laughs> God, I don't know. Um, Sister Act was wonderful. Oh, was it? Yes, it was. We have some very talented uh, faculty and students, and, mm -hmm. and it was great. Jose uh, Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew he could sing? <laughs> Uh, and attended the uh, Triple S 4.0 plus um, dinner. That was very nice. Mm -hmm. Trustee no report. Okay. Trustee Martinson. Um, I also went to Sister Act and, yeah, I enjoyed it. I'd never seen the movie. I didn't know the story, so that was a lot of fun. And um, thank you for the T-shirt. That's it. All right. Meeting oh, I want to adjourn this meeting, actually. Um, uh, we got an email today about one of our faculty, adjunct faculty that passed away, David Stevens. Um, so I'd like to adjourn this meeting in honor of David Stevens. <laughs>